And now it's our pleasure to welcome the President of the United States, George W. Bush, to the Daytona 500. Welcome, Mr. President. I am really glad to be here. At, uh, if you've never been to a Daytona 500, it's hard for me to describe <laughs> what it's like to be down here with the drivers and to see the huge crowd and to feel the excitement for one of America's great sporting spectacles. Well, there are 200,000 people here and million more, millions more watching on television. Yeah. They took the day off from work, so we'll make this a race-related conversation well, instead I appreciate of a work-related <laughs> conversation. You've been to some great sporting events, including throwing out the first pitch at the World Series after 9-11. Can you tell us about that experience, sir? Well, that was one uh, that happened, uh, you know, when the, uh, the Yankees were helping to lift the spirit of the New York citizens, and I walked out there and... Uh, the chants of the crowd were, were loud, and it was just an exciting moment. It was a, it was a historic moment for me personally because it was uh, after such tragedy. I was a little nervous about getting my fastball over the plate. <laughs> well, you did a great job. You've been to the Salt Lake Olympic Games, to the Army-Navy game. How does this compare? Well, this is huge. This has got this covers a lot of territory. You know, the track is big, the expanse is big. There's people in the infield. There's people who've been camping out here. This is. Uh, this is uh, more than an event. It's a, it's a way of life for a lot of people. And, uh, and, and it, you can feel the excitement when you're here. And it's, I'm really looking forward to, to watching a lot of the race. Now, in December, you had several drivers to the White House. You allowed them to park their grass, their, <laughs> their cars on the grass. I did. That was very nice of you, sir. Well, it takes a special person to be allowed to be parking on the grass there at the White House. But it's neat to meet these are drivers. They're courageous people. They, they know no fear. And yet they're, they're, they're in good shape. They're well conditioned in order to stay in the in these uh, small little cars for as long as they do, and obviously they got great reflexes. And so, I, in, in meeting them, I was meeting some great athletes. Now, is there any truth to the rumor that Tony Stewart asked for a presidential pardon after his tough <laughs> yeah, season? Well, he, uh, you know, he came in as the champ. He wasn't asking for any pardons. He was asking for a photograph, and I was happy to to pose with him because he was the champ. And uh, and uh, I saw him. I needled him when I came by because he's got. You know, somehow, sometimes you get a reputation where you're in public life, and uh, but he's a good, solid citizen, a good fella. Your uh, motorcade moves pretty fast. Any desire to uh, ride in one of these, sir? Well, I'd like to, but I'm afraid the agents wouldn't let me. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm a, you know, I flew fighters when I was in the guard, and I like speed, and. Uh, it would have been fun to drive up on these banks. People don't understand how steep these banks are, though, till you see them in person. And uh, I was with Bill Elliott, who was telling me that uh, he set the course record here at 210 miles an hour. I can't imagine taking a bank at 210 miles an hour. All five branches of the armed services represented here this weekend on the track, and I know that's important to you, sir. Well, it is, and one of the things about NASCAR and the NASCAR fans is they support our military. We've got a lot of really good young men and women who are sacrificing for our country. And these fans and, and the people of the, of the France family and the drivers, they stand with our military. And for that, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm the commander in chief of a great group of people. And to know that citizens who support NASCAR support them makes me feel good. I know you're a sports fan, and I know you had ownership interest in the Texas Rangers. Right. The big news is A-Rod going to uh, the Yankees. Yeah, so. I was just as surprised as the Yankee fans and the Boston Red Sox fans when I opened up my paper today. It obviously is a big deal. and. Uh, uh, it, it looked like the deal's going to happen. At least the sports pages said they were close to concluding the deal. A-Rod's a great player, uh, and uh, the Yanks are going to be a, a heck of a team with him in the infield. Mr. President, it's truly an honor. Thank you for attending the Daytona well, 500. Enjoy your day. Thrilled to be here. Good to see you, sir. Thank you, sir. Back upstairs to Allen. Okay, Bill, thanks. An already special day, Daytona 500 day, made all the more so by the presence of the President of the United States. Now it's butterfly time for the drivers. They begin buckling into their machines. The start is coming up. NBC Sports live at Daytona International Speedway, where the Daytona 500 is moments from getting started. We go trackside for the Invocation National Anthem and command to start engines. Well, apparently the president is still walking around shaking some hands, and they're still getting uh, the motorcade organized so we can get the... Uh, oh, that's why he's busy with some important people. The military. And since he's the one that's going to say, uh, gentlemen, start your engines, they want to make sure he's ready to go before they put that into play, huh? Would be a good idea. Tell you what, you could just feel the energy in this crowd just uh, uh, 
Bill talked about it earlier, but you could just feel the energy surge when that motor came, came, oh, came, motor came, came rolling around the track. How cool is that, BP, President, come to see us? It is a big deal. I've been here for three presidents now. Reagan back in 84. Yep. His father was here in 1992, and now George W. Yep. And the president visiting with some members of the uh, armed services before uh, coming out to the head end of the field to conduct his duties to get this race underway. There's uh, the first lady just behind him. I don't guess there's anybody there that's got enough nerve to go up and say, come on, Mr. President, you got yeah, the exactly. job to do. <laughs> he kinda, he's going to set the agenda here. <laughs> exactly. Uh, which is perfectly fine. And uh, the driver, some of them, matter of fact, just before the president walked up to the members of the military, he was speaking with Greg Biffle, whose car is lined up in the first position for the uh, pace laps. And Greg just climbed into his car, so he needs a couple of minutes to get strapped in and get all of his safety equipment uh, hooked together properly before he's ready to roll off and begin this race. Some NASCAR officials there as well. Some of the NASCAR executives now being greeted by Mr. Bush. And now you see the uh, flag ceremony being gathered, the national anthem singers as well. And as the president makes his way toward the center of pit road, we are closing in on the invocation national anthem and his command to get the 46th running of the Daytona 500 underway. Some 200,000 ready now for the start of the great American race. Let's head trackside now. They should be about ready to get the final portion of the opening ceremony underway. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise and remove your hats as color guard representing all five branches of the military, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Coast Guard present today's colors. Now please welcome Reverend Hal Marshman as he delivers our invocation. Almighty God and Father of all mankind, we thank you for this great world in which we live and for this great nation and for those who lead our nation. And we pause to give thanks to your goodness and bless us all and help us know that you are our God and we are your children. Shalom and amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain standing and welcome Curb Records recording artist and Grammy winner, Leanne Rhymes, as she sings our national anthem. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed how the twilight's last gleam made whose broad stripes had bright stars through the perilous fight For the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming How the road gets reckless The bombs bursting Still there, oh, say, does that star spangle banner yet away? Oh, the land of the free and the home. Thank you, Leanne Wines. Let's hear it for the B-2 Stealth Bombers out of Whiteman Air Force Base and the two f 15 from Seymour Johnson's Air Force Base. Also, a thank you to the beautiful Eagles from SeaWorld Orlando. Gentlemen, please welcome NASCAR Nextel Cup Series Championship driver, Mr. Bill Elliott. 
Ladies and gentlemen, for the most famous words in racing, the President of the United States. Thank you, Bill. Laura and I are honored to be here for this fantastic spectacle. We asked God's blessings on the drivers, NASCAR fans, and on our great nation. Now it is my honor to start this race. Gentlemen, start your engines. preliminaries a wonderful pre-race ceremony and now it's time it's time for the 46th running of the daytona 500 field of starters in today's daytona 500 still sitting along the pit lane warming the oils and fluids in the cars before they roll off to begin their parade and pace laps and approach the green flag in today's great american race Budweiser, the official beer of NASCAR, is proud to sponsor the Bud Pole Award given to the fastest qualifier in each NASCAR Nextel Cup race. Greg Biffle, second-year driver from Vancouver, Washington, earned his first Bud Pole Award. Zipping around this two-and-a-half-mile track at an average of over 188 miles an hour since 1979. Anheuser-Busch has awarded more than $8 million as title sponsor of NASCAR's Pole Award program. Unfortunately for Biffle, he won't get to keep that pole position because of an engine change in his car since Thursday's qualifying races by rule. He'll have to go to the back of the field. Still, we show you the starting grid for today's Daytona 500 in the order in which they're scheduled to take the green flag. Bibble and Elliott Sadler alongside each other on the front row, but everyone in that inside lane when Bibble drops to the back is going to move up a spot, BP, which will put the third place car. Dale Earnhardt Jr., number eight, on the pole for the Daytona 500. Sterling Marlin will start second. Tony Stewart's car repaired after a crash. You heard about that earlier. He's going to go from row number three. And Mark Martin, his 20th try in the Daytona 500. He's not won it yet. And Jamie McMurray, very fast. And look, last year's winner, Michael Waltrip, inside right, row five. Well... Jeff Burton, Matt Kenseth, the defending series champion in row number six. You heard from Bobby Labonte earlier on Countdown to Green, one of Joe Gibbs' two entries. He's in row number seven with Joe Nemechek in the U.S. Army-sponsored machine. Ricky Rudd driving for the Wood Brothers. Starts back at row number eight, his 27th 500, most of drivers in today's race. Rusty Wallace would love to win this 500, has never won. The 2002 winner, Ward Burton, in row number 10 with Ryan Newman, hoping not to end up upside down like he did a year ago. The rookie, Johnny Sauter, inside row 11. Jeremy Mayfield on the outside. Ohio's Dave Blaney and Michigan's Johnny Benson. In row number 12, Californian Casey Mears. And Wisconsinite Scott Wimmer in row 13. Another rookie driver, Casey Kane, row 14. Who replaced Bill Elliott this year. Elliott's going to run a reduced schedule. There's John Andretti. Uncle Mario won this race back in the late 1960s. And Robbie Gordon there with him. You look at the rest of the starting field. VP, fire up the old onboard radio over there. Let's try to talk to Greg Biffle. Hey, Greg, Benny Parsons, you got me? Uh, Parker on my tag, 37 seconds. He's talking to his crew, talking about what the tachometer is saying. 3,700 RPMs in second gear. That will be pit road speed, 55 third. miles per hour. Cars do not have speedometers. They have to go by attack on. Let's try again. Greg Biffle, Benny Parsons, you got me? That should be big. Hey, for a week, you've been on the penthouse, the 25th floor. In about one lap, you're going to the basement, to the very back of the field. Your thoughts? I'll tell you what, uh, the National Guard car is really, really fast. This uh, Yates uh, Roush horsepower under the hood. I don't think I'm going to be there very long. i got a really good race car. Uh, you know, the Bud Pole trophies at my motorhome, and uh, they've made the check out to me. So uh, it's unfortunate we got to go to the back, but we think we got a really good race car. Can you beat Junior? 
Uh, if I'm in front of him, I can beat him, but I'm not going to be for quite some time, so we'll see. Pit strategy is going to be important when this car's out front. It's really fast. Good luck, Greg. Greg Biffle getting set to pull out of line and drop to the end of the field on this uh, pace lap after the engine change in his number 16 Ford. Couple of drivers trying to qualify for the 500, unable to make the field. Kirk Shelmerdine and Andy Hillenberg had the heartbreak on Thursday. You'll have to watch today instead of being in the Great American Race. As you can see, not only Biffle goes to the back of the field, Scott Riggs, Ryan Newman, Ricky Craven, Derek Cope, all will move back from their starting position to the rear of the field. Which may not be a bad place to be. <laughs> We talked about that earlier. I mean, if you know, you first couple laps, boy, are very tense. Everybody's feeling their cars out. One nice thing about it is you're driving these cars right now, and all the butterflies are gone. You're ready to go. Those engines are running, so let's go race them. That bright yellow car is a 2004 Chevy Corvette Coupe, the official pace car of the Daytona 500. Pretty appropriate. Corvette, kind of an American icon, if you will, in performance cars. Wally, I guess your driving lessons paid off. My student, he looks good. Ben Affleck. <laughs> he looks a little calmer than he did the other day when he was <laughs> riding with you, though. I can understand that. A couple of more parade and pace laps. Want to get in one more commercial break before the start so we can show you as much green flag racing as possible. We're back in a minute. What a sight. The Daytona International Speedway. Packed with fans. Sold out. Some 200,000 here. Looking on as the 46 Daytona 500 is one and a half pace laps away from getting the green flag. Drivers all buckled in, getting their cars ready to go. Let's check down on pit road with the crews. Dave Burns. And about Sterling Marlin, guys. Uh, I talked to Sterling just after he finished up business with the president down here. And Sterling told me that they didn't change a thing on his car since yesterday's final practice session. He's very pleased with this car. He's also pretty happy about where he's starting today. He's starting fourth, and he started fourth when he won his very first of two Daytona 500s back in 1994. Matt? Jeff Burton starts 11th back in July of 2000, Dave. Jeff Burton gave Cardinal Jack Roush his first Daytona Nextel Cup car win. Now he wants to try to give his first Daytona. Daytona 500 win, but a victory today would go a long way in helping his team. The 99 team only has enough sponsorship through May. So meanwhile, it'd be a great place to get that trophy for the mantle. It would be great for the checkbook to keep that team alive. Marty Snyder. Matt here in January testing. Ricky Rudd had a car that was so fast, they didn't want to draft with it because they were afraid they would wreck it. Here in Speed Weeks, it's been equally as fast. The one bad thing, not in his favor right now, the weather. Ricky was hoping for cloudy, cool conditions. Instead, today it's hot and sunny. That does not play to their hand. Even though he's tried 26 times and never won this race, Bill, Ricky Rudd said it's a beautiful day for a Daytona 500 win. Marty, during January testing, I talked to Dale Earnhardt Jr. about just how big this race is, and here's what he told me. There are great drivers that never win the Daytona 500 and great drivers that never win a series championship. He said he doesn't know what would bother a driver more, ending his career without a Daytona 500 win or without winning a series championship. He added he hopes he never has to find out. Alan? Bill, he's on a lot of people's minds as a heavy favorite to win this Daytona 500 this year. But we know that many, many times the fastest car does not win this race. It's always filled with dramatic twists and turns as we get into those final laps. That is the entrance to pit road, and BP, it can be tricky. Yeah, you, it, new rule. You have First of all, you have to come in single file. And you've got to be single filed by that here. line right there, BP. Those two pylons, that white line. And here, the car is running about 190 miles per hour, 185, 190 miles per hour. And by here, you've got to be 55 miles per hour. And it is very, very hard to bring these cars down from 185 miles per hour to 55 in that short distance because the brakes aren't really good on these cars. Plus, you've got to judge the speed. A lot of times, you'll lock the tires up getting down into the pits, which you've got to be very careful of. And you're in very heavy traffic on pit road. When somebody stops short in front of you, sometimes things go wrong. Thursday's 125. Casey Kane, the red car, hits the brakes in front of Jeff Gordon. Jeff runs in the back of him, spins him on pit road. And that can completely take you out of being in the race. As Jeff damaged the nose of his car to the point that it overheated and knocked him out of contention on Thursday. The first pit stop 
keep an eye out for it. Usually someone makes a mistake and costs themselves a chance to win this race. And we got a lot of rookies that aren't used to coming down in this pit lane, and, and that could be a problem. The problem, you get to 55 miles per hour, your pit stall is on down pit road. You feel like after running 185, you feel like you can walk faster than that. You end up sliding through your pit. And not only that, PP, but you can't imagine how, or you can imagine, but a lot of people can't imagine how hard it is coming down pit lane. You see all those colors and all those pit boards flying. It's hard to find your pit sometimes. You've got to have your crew chief go 10, 9, 8, count you down to where you're getting close to the pit. Something to keep an eye on as we get in toward that first set of pit stops when this race gets underway. $16 million in awards on the line. Better than a million dollars to the winner. And the drivers all looking toward the starter stand. As they come off of turn number four, the honorary starter for the 500, Whoopi Goldberg, has the green flag in hand. In a minute, she's going to set 200,000 voices yelling in the air as these 43 drivers set off on their once-a-year chance to win their sport's biggest prize, the Daytona 500. Pace car is off. Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Elliott Sadler bring the field down for the start. The 46th Daytona 500 is green. gets in front he's so fast a lot of cars will not be in the pass now this track don't forget we've had a lot of rain here so the track is green there's not a lot of rubber so we're gonna these guys are gonna have to really feel the track out to see where these cars work the best yesterday the book race the high side was really good for some guys so there's a little bit of feeling around right now to see how your car is going to react and where it's going to react the best first few laps always very tense the traffic close together one driver makes a mistake a big problem for a number. Earnhardt Jr. leads lap one by about a foot. Tony Stewart is behind him in the 20, pushing. The outside lane is Elliott Sadler in 38, pushed by Sterling Martin in 40. And you've got to be careful right now. You do not want to be put in the middle. That's why these cars are running really close. You've got to watch in your mirror. You've got to put a block on, because if you get put in the middle, you're probably going to go backwards. But somebody's going to try the middle. They're going to feel like, well, maybe I can use the middle to go forward. Tony Stewart moved up to try to see what would happen if he got out behind the eight car. Look how the eight car shot away from him when those two cars, the 38 and 20, got side by side. This is pretty wide back there. Inside lane starting to advance a bit. Stewart clears Elliott Sapple for second place. Now it's Jamie McMurray in the 42 up to the inside of Sadler for third. And he's followed by Michael Walter in the 15 car, the winner of last year's Daytona 500. The good thing about Sadler, he's got a really good drafting partner right now. Sterling Marlin knows how to draft as well as anybody on this racetrack. So if he can keep Sterling there, he may just push him right back to the front. It is first to 40, two and a half seconds, covers the entire field. Look at that, 194 miles per hour. Larry Ford was running. On board, Kevin Harvick. Running in 10. And right now is the best these cars are going to feel. Because the tires will start wearing, and these cars will start sliding more and more every lap. McMurray clearing. That outside lane of Elliott Sadler. Michael Walshrip pushes through. Now the first four clear. This is a camera we have inside the helmet of Michael Waltrip. You see the visor crack just a little bit to keep from fogging up. And this really gives you an idea of what the driver goes to and how violent that these cars are on this Daytona racetrack. Checking the mirror to his left, now looking ahead to the corner ahead of him. Michael Waltrip running in fourth position. Just doesn't look like that outline. Outside line's got it, man. Not right now, he doesn't, but it might be because the A car is just simply so fast. Jimmy Johnson in 48, racing Elliott Sadler now. That'll be for fifth place. 
Dale Earnhardt Jr. kind of got a gift for that pole position when uh, Greg Bibble's team had to change the engine, Bill. He's making the most of it right now. That's how good he is, Alan. He got the pole while it was in a different race. How about that? Yeah. Led the field to the green flag. Same car that they ran at the sport restrictor plate races last year. Was a little tight in the twin 125s. Jr. wasn't really pleased with it yesterday. They worked on it to try and make him happy today, Dave. Bill, we showed Tony Stewart's pre uh, last happy hour final practice crash yesterday in the pre-race show today. Tony's team worked on that car a lot yesterday afternoon. And I talked with crew chief Greg Zipidelli this morning. I said, well, did you get it to a field dressing state or is it better than that? And he kind of laughed and said, it's better than that. It's not as perfect as we want it. Marty? Dave Michael Walker put us on countdown to green and reiterated to me before he got in the car, I will work with the eight car. We will work together. Our number one goal at DEI this year, work together, together better than we ever have. It starts today, but on the last lap, it's every man for himself. Michael Waltrip has won the Daytona 500 in two of the last three years. He's running in fourth now. Starting to climb that hill back there. Is that Matt Kenseth? Matt Kenseth, the 17 car, the 2003 Cup champion, has moved to the top of the racetrack, and he's finding some good grip up there. Actually, Ben, he's been up there really since lap one, so he was the first guy that went way up on that bank. I'm not sure he's going up there because he likes it up there because maybe his car is tight and it won't turn. Marty, what are they saying about the 17 car? He's been up in that top groove, Wally, since Thursday. They really haven't run the bottom groove that much, but Matt likes to run up there, especially in the early run. Wally, you can talk about this. He wants to save that right front tire. If you try to keep the car on the bottom and force it down to be on the bottom, it'll wear out that right front quicker. You're right. It's easier on the right front tire if you're up high. These guys down on the bottom are tugging on the steering wheel. Oh, we got some oh, smart cars six car. Trouble turn number three. And the caution flag is out. Oh, hang on there, Mark. I don't think Mark can see anything there for a while. He's done. Uh-oh. Oh, Johnny Benson still can't see it, I don't think, out of that car. Robbie Gordon bouncing off each other. That car was just completely filled with smoke. Mark did a great job there trying to keep it as straight as possible. Mark Martin's 20th try. I couldn't see nothing. I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see. And how disappointing is that? Oh. I mean, he really, Mark Martin really felt like he had something today to win the Daytona 500. Dave? BP, I talked with Mark Martin right before the start of today's race and asked him about whether or not they had conquered the problems they had on Thursday. Mark believed that they had. He said he hadn't had any problems on Friday. Unfortunately, it looks like there's something deeper in their motors. Yeah, that's, that's deep when he's had that much smoke come out of the exhaust pipes. Watch a car up there on the high bank. You'll see a little bit of smoke here for a second, and then, boy, it just pours out. Watch everybody dive underneath, and he can't see anything. Wow. And I tell you what, looks like he took, he made the 99 and 17, might have made some contact, teammates of Mark Martin. Kevin Harvick, I'll bet he's got a windshield full of liquid right now. So he'll be having to make a pit stop, probably. And he's right behind Martin when that engine let go. Wow. Maybe a little bit of contact there with... I don't think it did too much damage to 17, but boy, great job by everybody on that one. Now, pit road is going to be open. I wonder, this early in the race, eight laps into the race, if anybody will come in. I would say so. Leaders come by the opening of pit road. First one is Kevin Harvick. He's going to jump in there. And get his windshield clean. Yeah. Right, from 10th spot. Followed by some of the other cars farther back. You see Matt Kenseth and the 17 is in. After the contact he had, getting squeezed in that uh, little, little shuffle up. Dave? And of course, Kevin Harvick needing to come in and take care of that windshield. No report on exactly how bad it was, but, if, but it was going to be obviously covered. They'll work on him, get it cleaned off, and get it back out, change four tires at the same time. Bill? Rusty Wallace still looking for his first win of Daytona by in the Daytona 500. This will be a four tire stop in fuel and the first test of how good four new tires are going to go up against old ones. Rusty stalled and he's on his way. Ah, you can't do that at Daytona. Oh, uh -oh. tire loose. That's going to cost somebody. Whoa, no, is that Derek Cope ran right over the cone. And that's a new tire somebody was trying to put on the car. You can tell by the sticker that's still on it as it rolls around there. And somebody hit car. one of... Might be the car that's still sitting there. That, who is that, Skinner? 
See the tape and the little white sticker on the left side of that tire. That means it's a brand new, what they call a sticker tire. That's Skinner. I don't know if they... So they had to go fish another one out from behind the pit wall and put it on. So we'll caution early in the Daytona 500 after Mark Martin's 20th try to win the race literally went up in smoke. It wasn't a pretty sight for Kevin Harvick, who was running behind Mark Martin when the thing let go. Wow. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. A gorgeous day in Daytona Beach, Florida for the 46th running of the Daytona 500. Just underway before a sellout crowd of over 2,000, 200,000, excuse me, were under the first caution after Mark Martin lost an engine up in turns three and four. On the ensuing set of pit stops, we showed you the tire that rolled loose. It came from Mike Skinner's car, and now we'll show you why. Ricky Craven was pitting in front of Skinner, and the right rear tire changer rolls a tire back across the wall. Back over to the wall, there's the tire. Now watch the tire carrier for the 33 car start to come out, trips over that tire, falls, and the, his tire rolls out on the pit road. Well, he took a shot. He did. <laughs> It's a good thing they wear those helmets, huh? Yes, sir. Matt Yoakum. And the crew member that was injured, Alan, is John Wallace. He also pits Ron Hornaday in the NASCAR Bush Series. Just some facial lacerations. The EMTs are looking at his forehead and also his wrist, which he is holding, but it appears like a very, very, very lucky incident here. It could have been much worse. Marty? Well, Matt, Matt, the smile on the Mark Martin's face before the race was, was very wide, not a very big smile. Now, the second engine problem, what happened, Mark? Well, this is our first one. Um, you know, I don't you know, I don't know. All I know is that I couldn't see. Man, I hate it. I probably messed some guys up out there, but I didn't know. I couldn't see the wall. I couldn't see the track. I couldn't see anything. Thank goodness the spotter. He kept telling me to stay up, but I didn't know what up was. Uh, just like putting a blindfold on me. And their day is done, and uh, Wally, he said right before it blew, it made the pop, 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 pop sound. You probably heard that before, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, that's an ugly sound. And it's even worse when you can't see. Matt Kenseth has been back on pit road for a second time under this caution flag. You saw the contact between he and Brendan gone as uh, Mark Martin was trying to feel his way around to slow down. And Mark is listed as the owner of the 17 car. So we're coming to the restart. Dale Earnhardt Jr. leads. Tony Stewart is second. Jamie McMurray third. Michael Waltrip fourth. Jimmy Johnson fifth. The drivers who pitted are all pretty deep in the field. The front half of the pack did not stop under that early caution. Now this is a great chance for these cars behind trying to get the cars up speed to try to hook up together and go by Jr. But can they? Well, I think they can because, like you said, BP, they're all in a line. So if Tony Stewart were to pull out and they all would go with Tony, they would pass the eight car Dale Earnhardt Jr. But let's see if that's what they want to do. Just give you a couple quick updates here. Uh, no penalty for Mike Skinner's team for that tire getting away. Obviously, it was not an error. Uh, there was a pretty significant reason why. And also, uh, the first of the cars that pitted in the restart is Kevin Harvick, and he's 18th in line. Bill? Yeah, Alan, you, were got, you guys were just talking about how long these guys will stay in line or what will happen. Well, under caution, there was a conversation between the 20 crew and the 8 crew via the spotters, and here's what it sounded like. Junior, Tony Spotter come down and said, if possible, if you can keep it on the bottom more, because when you, when you come up a little bit, he watches the front end, and everybody behind him gets to run on you guys. Oh, okay. I was just giving him a headlight down there if he wanted to clean it, you know, clean left front headlight. Uh, but I'll stick right on the bottom end. That's fine. That's better for me. How fantastic is that that Junior said, I'll give him a headlight, put some downforce on that 20 car to help the car turn and help save that right front tire. And that was Stevie Reeves, the spotter. But well, there's some guys up on the outside that they don't want to run the bottom. No, they want to pass these guys. And you know what? I think they're going to come fast. You got the 18 car up there. You got Greg Biffle. You got some new tires in that outside lane right there. Kevin Harvick. There's Bobby Devine in the green car, the 18, leading that outside lane there. Was Bobby one of the guys that come in? And, and no, he did not. He did not? No. But Harvick certainly. Oh, oh there's, there's Biffle. Is that Biffle? Might have, Biffle? It might have been Biffle that got in the wall. Yeah, it was BP. Yeah, just with the right rear, that's a tiny bit. 
When you hit the wall like that, even if it's a little bit, you lose a lot of momentum and you lose a lot of positions. You also lose a lot of downforce on that right rear bell. And he'd already had overheating problems, Benny. They elected not to bring him in under the caution, but I heard the number 250 while they were under green while he was in the draft. 250 is not going to work here today. Not for long. Oh, look at that car just go right through the middle. Trying to go through the middle. Rusty Wallace in the middle. Are you gonna, you're going to be able to do that. Wow, that was exciting there in the back. He's way Somebody back got in. loose. Rusty way back in 23rd position. Let's take another look at what happened to Greg Biffle just a minute ago in that 16 car coming up off turn two. See him, he just makes contact right there. Left a tire mark on the wall. And these fenders are so finely tuned. They spend weeks and months getting these fenders tuned in a wind tunnel to be just the perfect shape. And he's just rearranged it. Yeah, and it, it turn two is the, the trouble spot on this racetrack for a car to push or not turn. And if you just get the right cars around you and you get in the wrong position, all of a sudden it just feels like you hit ice and you go sliding up the racetrack. And that's exactly what it looked like Biffle had. No grip in the front. Well, these guys have been pretty good so far, but some of these fellows are getting a little bit antsy, and that's when you have some trouble. The 26 cars in this lead pack, then a little separation to the rest of the field. And, and this is, too, right where the point where these guys are going to have to start working with that throttle. This is where you see how your car is handling. If you can keep the gas pedal down all the way around without lifting, you've got a really good handling race car right now. But some of these guys are floating the throttle because their cars are not turning. So they're having to back off the gas. This is where you're going to start thinking about what changes you have to make to the car for that first pit stop. Somebody's very, very high off the corner over there. It's body to body, I thought. A lot of new things in NASCAR Racing 2004. The series sponsor, of course, Nextel. We've talked already today about a new generation of tires. And Dave Burns, there's a lot more new on pit for this race as well. That is Sunoco, the new official fuel of NASCAR. Uh, they've come in to give fuel all year long to these teams, fuel that they can trust, fuel that they can trust for its uh, quality, and uh, that it will stay the same. And I tell you what, what, they have a lot of work to do down here today because fuel runners from every team will be bringing their dump cans down here and getting them filled all day long, and the dump cans are new too. They added an extra gallon to them this year. They're 12 instead of 11, and the guys that haul those up and gas the car on pit road, well, those weigh over 90 pounds now. It's not an easy job, and they'll be some of the busiest people on pit road today. All right, now, these cars I was just watching, they're starting to move around a lot more, Benny. These cars are starting to slide around. Look like the seven-car Jimmy Spencer. His car is not working really good. He was up there in the top ten a little while ago, slid back. This is where the handling is really going to start showing. The Spencer started 40 and worked his way up to about the top 10. But now you're right, he's starting to work his way back. And he did hit on that last caution. So he's doing that after stopping. That's pretty impressive. Let's check out our singular wireless race talk poll early in this Daytona 500. Got a lot of drivers who've been here for a lot of years who've never won the race. Which of these drivers do you think has the best chance to end his 500 winless streak? Uh, well, that, we should have showed this earlier, huh? Yeah. yeah. We can mark one off the list. Any, one, any other one of those three guys got a good shot. Cast your ballot and check out your thoughts a little bit later on. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has led every lap of the Daytona 500 so far, but he's not very much ahead of Tony Stewart. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. Just completed the first 50 miles of the 46th Daytona 500. Dale Earnhardt Jr. leading a four-car breakaway from the rest of the pack. Tony Stewart, Jimmy Johnson, and Kevin Harvick included in that group. Harvick, impressive, running up to the fourth place because, remember, he did it under the caution back at lap number eight. Oh, Casey Mears, 41 car, slow on the apron of the race Right track. front, Benny, right front down. Oh, man. doesn't look like it's a hey, 23 laps could yeah. it be that the right front tire is worn that the balance is not correct on this car 
Now don't forget that they uh, here in Daytona and on most of the larger tracks in NASCAR, they run an inner liner, like an old tube inside a bicycle tire. In case you have a flat at 190 miles an hour, it's something there to keep you from going completely down on the rim and help you from having a big crash. Yep. Well, this hurts coming in all by yourself under green. Right side tire started to roll forward a little bit, so he must have taken his foot off the brake. They come around to the left side, put on the left side tires. They'll send him back out, top him off with fuel. He's out of sequence, away from the pack. This could be a long day. Now we just got to hope and pray that all these other cars hit before a caution flag should come out. Hey, Benny, let me ask you something. What about the guys that didn't stop under that caution if this stays green? Well, they, uh, you're right. If the, they pit, then the caution flag comes out. They could be a lap down, including Dale Earnhardt Jr. Bill, check that right front tire for us, will you? Tell you what, I'm so impressed with uh, Kevin Harvick. He's just taking third spot away from Jimmy Johnson. Well, he's, he's got 10 lap new tires and anybody else up there. And, and we talked about the tire issue the whole time we've been down here. It's going to make a big difference. He restarted 18th when we went back under green at lap number 11. Jimmy Johnson slipped back a position to fourth when Harvick made that pass. Matt, how about the 48? Well, Harvick was making that pass. Jimmy Johnson let him go. He felt like the 29 was being a little impatient this early on, so he shouldn't lose his patience. They're going to pin about eight more laps. Jimmy said the car was running about 240 as far as the water temperature. They were going to pin him in that first caution. Decided not to, Bill. Matt, all four tires on the 41 appear to be okay. So maybe it was a feel thing, but especially the right front, they all look to be okay. Team's still looking at them now. But there you get You come off the corner, you get yourself in the right position like you talked oh, about. Oh, trouble. Got another smoker. It's Jeff Burton. Oh, my goodness. Two of the Roush Yates yeah, engines. We'll the bottom, a lot of smoke out of those hogs, a lot. Here, all the way to the bottom. Check your brakes here, good. Check your brakes. NBA All-Star Game on TNT Machine is uh, just had a double dribble. Yes, it did. Hey, Benny. Yeah. Remember we talked to uh, the 16 bunch this morning? Yeah. They had that problem with Biffle's motor yesterday, and all the Roush guys went back and changed those bolts we were talking about. Exactly. They rocky. Greg Biffle broke a rocker stand bolt yesterday, so Doug Gates this morning changed bolts on all the eight engines they had here. Jeff Burton to pit road safely. We stay under green. That's certainly going to make the other teams nervous right now and have the same engine combination. I guess. Kevin Harvick in third, trying to run down the second place driver, Tony Stewart. Farther back, Jeff Gordon. Sliding up the racetrack, trying to pick up a spot. Losing the spot there, Kurt Busch sliding in front of Jeff Gordon. That'll be for sixth and seventh places. There's Michael up outside of Jeff Gordon. Looks like he's going to take that spot pretty easily. All right, so Gordon losing a couple positions here. We should be coming up on some green flag pit stops for some of these guys that didn't pit before. So let's take a break. We'll come back in time for the visits to pit road. Earnhardt Jr. leads the 46th running of the Daytona 500. Just a little bit. I'm a little bit tight. Bobby Labonte pulls in his stall safely behind him. Half a pound on the right front, Dave. Tony Stewart's car was a little loose on entry, but pretty neutral. They decided to make no chassis changes for fresh tires and fuel for, for Tony. Bill Earnhardt Jr. chasing the car at both ends, but he said no changes. Wanted to make sure he pitted with the 20, Matt. A great stop by Jimmy Johnson's crew. A chassis adjustment. His car was tight on lane edges. Four tires. Gonna cost Bobby Labonte, we talked about it earlier, getting on a pit lane. So tough to get the car wowed down sometimes without locking up the front tires. He's kind of cut out of the herd at this point with no drafting help. Kevin Harvick is the new leader. Here comes Sterling Marlin and some others to pit road. There's Harvick. Check out that rush to pit road again. Watch Bobby Labonte. And the pylon that I talked about earlier that you gotta be between he cleaned that pylon out, just ran right over it. He said, okay, I can make my pit. Let me go across pit road here. That's a long way to the pit. Dave? Elliot Sadler is in. They changed four tires, and he's already gone. No chassis adjustments. Sterling Marlin, Ricky Rod also in, Bill. 
And he, they had trouble with the left rear, trouble with the lugs on the left rear, long stop from Ricky, air pressure adjustment, and chassis adjustment. He could not hold the car in the middle of the track, kept drifting up to the wall. Ricky Craven and Jimmy Spencer also leaving after green flag pit stops. There's Spencer in the seven. He's going to lap down. Yeah, that's the thing now. Kevin Harvick stopped at lap eight along with a number of others so they can run that right. much farther before they have to pit. And if the caution comes out now, all these guys who just pitted under green have got a problem. Marty. Alan Bobby Labonte said nothing about missing pit road. When he left pit road, all he said is, how bad is it? His crew chief, Michael McSwain, said, don't worry about it. The valence has rolled under just a little bit, but we should be fine. Trouble, turn four. Got a car into the wall. Derek Cole. Oh, there's that yellow they didn't need. Oh, boy, I'm telling you. Oh, the junior stays on the lead lap. Caution flag is out. The 1990 Daytona 500 winner has hit the wall up in turn four. No, oh, great break for Harvick, Gordon, and boys. Let's see. Tony Stewart, Dale Jr., Jimmy Johnson. They're all going to stay on the lead lap. Michael Waltrip as well. Here he comes. And there he goes. Punch. Tell what caused that. Hey, what is That's luckily a one-car accident with yeah. this pack of cars coming up behind him. He lost it way, way up there. Well, he just bought, who's that he bounced off of? It might have been Scott Riggs. But it happened way, way back up there between three and four when he started losing it. Yeah. And that, well, it's, when he came back down the track, he bounced off of somebody and then went back up toward the outside wall. I think it was the 10 car of uh, Scott Riggs. What this car, it is, uh, in fact, Riggs just drives by. He's got some pretty significant damage on the right side of his machine, so that's who it was. See all these cars just going by the pace car. The pace car will come out and pick up the leader, who is Kevin Harvick. So Tony Stewart, Dale Jr., Jimmy Johnson, Michael Waltrip, Jamie McMurray, uh, Kurt Busch. And it looks like Greg Biffle all managed to stay on the lead lap at that caution by getting off pit road just in front of Kevin Harvick. That was close. On board with Dale Jarrett as he drives up on the accident. The spotter has warned him there's trouble. He drives down on the apron of the racetrack and luckily gets by. Bob Jeffrey. He's gotten Dale through a lot of wrecks his career, hasn't he? He has. Yeah. Yeah, sure has. So the pace car in front of leader Kevin Harvick when they come back around to the opening of the pit lane. We'll see how many of these front runners uh, make a stop. Is that the lucky dog there? Ward Burton? Yep. No, I believe he was in front of Kevin Harvick, and when he slowed down, we'll double check this, but when he slowed down, Harvick got by him. Okay, and then he got they caught behind the pace car. Yeah, they put more back where should be. So that's why he's been sent around the pace car. Our Budweiser aerial coverage of today's Daytona 500. Looking down along with the sunshine on this beautiful East Central Florida day. Tell you what, the crew chiefs must be having fits. It was cloudy and overcast and cool this morning when they had to prepare their cars and get them through inspection. Now the sun's out, and here's another chance for them to make some adjustments as they come to pit road here at lap 35. Dave? Kevin Harvick gives up the lead to come in. His car was just a little bit tight, according to crew chief Todd Barrier. They will make a wedge adjustment. That's a wrench going in the back window, but change nothing else on the 29 car. Bill? Ryan Newman in the middle of the triple split. Just been a feeling out process for Newman. This is four tires and fuel, no chassis changes. Back. Bill, for the second straight stop, no adjustments for Jeff Gordon Chevrolet. Back on lap 24, he said, this car is absolutely beautiful. Harvick will win the battle off. He said the hovers between neutral and loose. It is great. Marty? Matt, Joe Nemechek came down pit road running third. The car just a little bit loose. They decided to make no changes to it. They're happy with the loose condition. That should help them later on. After all, the track is getting pretty tight. 
number of drivers did not pit under this caution flag. We'll reset the running order for you in just a moment. The Daytona 500 under caution at the Daytona International Speedway. It's going to be a glory day for one. And at Daytona International Speedway, we're wrapping up the second caution flag of the 46 Daytona 500. Yellow coming out after Derek Cope spun off of turn number four. NASCAR Bush Series update for you. Yesterday, the race stopped by rain after just 31 of the scheduled 200 laps. The Hershey's Kisses 300 will resume on Monday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We'll have live coverage for you on TNT with Dale Earnhardt Jr. leading the race when it was stopped for rain. Friday night spectacular Craftsman Truck Series race here at Daytona. Carl Edwards came back from like three different problems during the race to win. And he held off a fierce field uh, charging toward him at the checkered flag in the draft. Craftsman Trucks next race about a month from now in Atlanta. If you notice on the racetrack Tony Stewart is in front of Dale Earnhardt Jr. This is when they were coming to pit road for the green flag stops back at lap 29 and watch how Stewart got the lead. Yeah Stewart just got in to the pit lane faster than Dale Jr. And like I said earlier very hard to judge to slow your car down enough. You're really on the brakes you're downshifting and like BP said you got to be at 55 right there beginning right there to the next line. You've got to be at 55 miles per hour. Jr. Not taking any chances. He knows he has a great race car. So now Tony Stewart in front of Dale Jr. And Stewart is the race leader. There are a handful of cars in front of him on the racetrack in that outside lane, though. Those are all people on the tail end of the lead lap. The pace car came out, picked up the leader. Those cars were all a lap down at the time. The leaders peeled off the pit. These cars didn't. The leaders came off pit road behind them. They basically got two and a half miles to make up on Tony Stewart. They are tail end of the lead lap. This is when things get a little bit sticky. Kind of dicey. A little dicey. There's your leader, Tony Stewart, with the bubble over him. You've got the leader coming, and you got these guys that really need a yellow, and they're going to do a lot of blocking to try to keep Tony Stewart back so they don't get put a lap down. Got Elliot Sadler there in uh, 38, Mike Skinner in 33, Johnny Sauter in 30, Ricky Craven in 32, Ricky Rudd in 21, and Bobby Labonte in 18. Those are all tail end of the lead lap, two and a half miles behind the leader, Tony Stewart. This is where you gotta have patience, Benny. This is where guys lose their patience. Speaking of patience, how about three wide for the leader? And the 14 car was slow on that restart. Larry Foyt. Then you said, well, should I follow Tony? Eh, okay, I guess I'll go up there three wide. Don't want to be in the middle. 48 car, Jimmy Johnson to the inside. He's racing for that lead as well. Lead car is all sandwiched up in the lap traffic now. guys right in front of Tony Stewart and Dale Jr. They're really using the mirror, Benny. Because you've got to block the move if you can. You don't want to get past and put a lap down. Spencer caught in the center of the seven car. When you, when you get a lap down, it just says, I can't win. You've got to get that lap back. got to be on the lead. As long as you're on the lead lap, you've always got a shot. Ricky Rudd goes a lap down. So you got Jimmy Johnson in the 48 in the inside lane, Tony Stewart in the 20 in the outside lane. They're racing for the lead in and among all of these cars trying to stay on the lead lap. And that's probably a spot Casey Mears of that 41 <laughs> just does not <laughs> want to be in. On board Jimmy Johnson. Stewart's car off the back bumper. Larry Ford's car has made it around to the pit lane. We do stay under the green flag. Oh, look at the 97 car. Kurt Busch just drives down under Tony Stewart. What a move. So Jimmy Johnson takes the lead. And Kurt just can't follow him through and get up there in front of Stewart. Well, he tried so hard. Oh, that's close contact there. 
Earnhardt Jr. and Stewart. Yeah, and Earnhardt Jr. put the, what we call bump draft, and you kind of bump the guy ahead of you. You only want to do that in the straightaway, but it helps shove the car in front of you. It gives you a little bit more speed. So Jimmy Johnson chose the lane that moved in that big traffic jam. He jumped down to that inside lane and has gotten in front of Stewart for the lead, but maybe not for long. Yes, yeah, Stewart got a big, big run getting off the back straightaway in the turn three. Here goes Junior in the middle. Is he going to make it three wide? Casey Kane is Ooh, slow on the easy. back stretch. Woo. 20 car. Wow, that's a handful. We saw Casey Kane. Ray Everham's nine car off the pace. And that looked a little sideways, but you know what, folks? That's big sideways when you run 190 miles per hour. Matt, what, what, what happened with the nine car? Tommy Baldwin just asked Casey, is it running or is it coasting? He says it is coasting. They told him to try the backup ignition box to see if that might help the race car fire. Casey just said it's something big. Yeah, it's it big. It is broken. It is smoking. It's big, Matt. He's got big smoke coming out of the pipes. Dale Earnhardt Jr. just pushing Tony Stewart down that back stretch. Jimmy Johnson in the 48, trying to mount another charge in that inside lane. And Tony Stewart pulls up behind the rookie, oh, Johnny Stewart. Oh. He said, rookie, <laughs> look in the mirror. <laughs> oh, man. Yikes. Johnny Sauter in that 30 car. The Sooner Wisconsin native driving to Richard Childress Racing. And now we're on board Tony. Man, look at the run he's got on the straightaway. Boom! He'll hit the car of Ricky Craven. That's the bump draft. Help push Ricky. But like I said, you got to be real careful. You don't want to do that too late getting into the corner either because it gets you sideways when you get in the corner. You really need to be careful to be straight when you do that. When Sauter jumped out, he wasn't exactly straight. He almost got turned sideways. You know, think about doing that. Oh, got a smoker. Another one in the middle of the pack. Looks like a Another right Roush car. Bush. Another Roush car, BP. Oh, oh man. man. That looks like a right front fender to me. Could be. Could be. Maybe get some. Pull it down, Tom. Maybe he had some contact with somebody. Did he just say cool it down some? Is that what he said? I'm like a, it's got like a kink in it. Right there at the it's balance got some contact. and up on the tire. Yeah, the right front fender is rubbing the tire. That's the smoke. He's going to have to go to pit road to get that fender knocked out off that tire. He was running fourth. Well, who's the other guy? Yeah, who's he got hit? that kind of damage. Somebody else has got some damage somewhere. Well, let's find out. Who did the 97 hit? Watch okay, there, Junior's car. There you see down on the bottom, he gets right into the left rear, left rear tire of Dale Jr. Now, if it just hit the tire, Jr. will probably be okay. Boy, look at the, look at all of them. Man, damage there. Doesn't take much to like Alan was talking about earlier. These guys spend so much time getting these bodies perfect. Just a little bit of a rub is going to hurt the handling of your race car. Go ahead, Dave. Kurtz guys go to work on the right front. They've already uh, they've jacked it up to change the two right side tires. The tolerances are so close between the fenders and the tires, there's no way they can work on that if they had the tires still on there. So they pulled it off. They will now go to work to bang it out underneath, try to get it close to the aerodynamic beauty that it used to be. Marty, what's happening with Jeff Burton? Well, Dave, unfortunately, his car is going up on the hollow lift, and that's two Roush Yates ins and Jeff. If you were still out there, would you be concerned? Well, certainly, you know, when you see uh, two, and then with Greg saying yesterday, it certainly ca is a cause for concern, but we don't even, I don't even know if the two things are the same. We might have two separate incidents, I don't know, but uh, I'm not going to blame those engine guys. They're working really hard, and, and uh, you know, this is, this is what happens when you're trying to progress your deal. We're trying to make our deal better, and sometimes it, it works really, really good, and then you'll have a setback. This is a setback, but it won't, it's a temporary setback. It's not a permanent setback. Bill? Well, Dale Earnhardt Jr. on the track and all that traffic. No comment on his radio after the contact with the 97. And part of the reason for that is he couldn't get a word in. His spotter, Stevie Reeves, on the radio the whole time, walking Earnhardt through traffic a lap ago. That's because of practice earlier this week. Earnhardt scolded his spotter, stay, saying, stay with me, stay with me the whole time. Reeves said he's never seen anybody that 
aggressive in practice or the race, man. And Jeff Gordon told me earlier in the week, he gave some advice to Brian Vickers, the 20-year-old. If you get in traffic and see me, jump in, follow, and learn. That's exactly what he's doing. An excellent day so far for Vickers. Rick Hendrick told me today, his advice, he told him, just be patient and don't get frustrated. You've got a great car. When you get shuffled to the back, and you will, slowly work your way back to the front. That's exactly what he's done and hooked up with Gordon. Vickers driving that 25 car for Hendrick Motorsports behind his uh, older and more experienced teammate. And I'll tell you what, th sitting in one of these race cars, this is madness. I mean, you are, you're doing everything you can. You've got your hands full. You are so busy right now in that race car with these race cars sliding around. Man, it is, and these guys are driving hard right now. So the traffic starting to thin a little bit and all the shuffling in two and three wide. Jenny Johnson has slipped back in front of Tony Stewart and Earnhardt Jr. So it's Johnson, Earnhardt Jr., Stewart, the top three. Your guess from there on back, they're all right there in a big pack. You're watching NASCAR on NBC. We come back to the Daytona 500. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has just stuck the nose of the Budweiser Chevy underneath Jimmy Johnson's 48 car. Hold on. There goes Jimmy <laughs> back by. I think. Yeah, that's a pretty good contest right now. Kurt Busch, 97 car, off pit road, two nearly three laps down to the leaders. After repairs to the right front corner of his car, he showed you the hit with Earnhardt Jr. earlier. I think Stewart wanted to stay up in that high line, probably to help his teammate, the 18 car, Bobby Labonte, to try to stay close to that front to get his lap back, but... Decided to go low. Was well, the choice of 8 or 18? Uh, I think I'll take the 8. My teammate's just going to have to go on his own. He's going to have to tuck it out, right? Bill, where are deals being made down there? Yeah, uh, well, they're talking a lot. Well, Junior moving to the inside all over the track. 20 team and the 18, they've been running together. Junior moved to the outside. But what they want to do, Benny, is they want to make sure they're going to pit on the same lap. Last time, the 8 car was going to pit on lap 31, but when they found out the 20 was going to come a lap earlier, they came that time. They had told Junior to take 30 on the track, come in on 31. They said, no, 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 hit this time. They want to stay with the 20. Here comes Bobby Labonte on the outside, Benny. Uh -huh. He wants to get on that lead lap. 18 car, the first one lap down, and he's in 30th place. Mach 3 Turbo Champion, the only razor used by the Gillette Young Guns, invites you to enter the Gillette Young Guns Challenge. Each week, a lucky fan's going to win $5,000. You can log on to GilletteYoungGuns.com for details twice during 2004, in May at the Coca-Cola 600, and in November for the Ford 400. Fans will have a chance to win a grand prize of $5 million. Wow. If you pick Dale Earnhardt Jr., he holds on to wins today's race. You could be entered into that. You will be entered into that. He will win five grand. See if the 18 gets in front of the 20. 20 decides to follow the 18 if it all sorts out. Bobby Labonte not on the lead lap. Matt Kenseth right behind Labonte in the 17 is. That is the fourth place car. And Kurt Busch has moved up to the outside, hoping that Junior would go with him, but he goes by Elliott Sadler anyway. Yes, remember, though, BP, that 97 has fresher tires than all these other cars he's racing with. That unscheduled pit stop is ready to go. How about Jimmy Johnson, Matt? Jimmy says the car is just a tick on the tight side. Jimmy has never won a restrictor plate race. Chad Knauss has gone to victory lane here in the 500. As a crew member on Jeff Gordon's team last night while doing media in victory lane, when it was all said and done, Chad walked up on the winner's podium, stood there, and then wrote CK. He wanted to mark his spot, reserve it for later today. They feel like they've got a great car that can go to victory lane. Now it's just up to Jimmy. Matt, you see Matt Kenseth up in the front there, and uh, you would never, you would never realize that they had some damage early on. They have tailpipe damage, which Robbie Reiser, the crew chief, believes is hurting the horsepower. They also have some body damage, hurting the aerodynamics. But Matt keeping the car up front. Bill, and an outstanding run so far for Craig Biffle. Won the pole here a week ago today. Had to start at the rear of the field because an engine change. This morning he said he was confident, but somewhat concerned with that new engine. But he's had a good run and done a good job getting it to the front. Burns and Weber, we're keeping our eye on these sets of tires that come off the cars. Kevin Harvick stayed out as long as anyone on that first run and pitted as the leader. I checked out all his tires. 
checked with the crew. Everything looks very good. Even that right front, the most sensitive of the tires. Matt? Dave, the Gordon-Vickers combination made it up to fifth and sixth. Then Jeff said, my car is just a little more on the free side. Please ask Brian to give me a little bit of slack back there. He gave a little too much. Lost position. He's dropped back to nine. Hey, what Jeff Gordon's been coming up through that pack. You know, I'm thinking, watching him, he and Kevin Harvick, Wally and Benny, we're seeing a different kind of Daytona 500 than we have the last few years, and it's because of these new tires that NASCAR asked Goodyear to develop. If you're not familiar with the story, the tires in past years have been so durable and so good that you didn't need tires. You could basically run a set all day long, and they wouldn't lose any speed. And it became where the first guy off pit road was going to be the guy that won the race. Drivers wanted that changed by NASCAR so that a car's handling and a driver's skill were once again more of a factor in deciding a race. Goodyear did that, and we're seeing the cars that handle better, like Harvick and Tony Stewart and these guys, able to drop back in the pack and then come back up and do a lot of passing. I think the fans wanted it more than the drivers did. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I agree. I'm probably right, but... It, these guys, that the teams that can adapt to changes the best are still going to be the best teams. They're going to have the cars. They're going to be the fastest. But I think once Sauce... Uh -oh. oh, trouble. Back straight away. Rusty Wallace, Jeff Green, and more. An easy wave them off behind you. Back it down. Coming to the caution. That's Ken Schrader. Kenny Schrader. Oh, darn it. <clears throat> Schrader and Rusty in the 43 car. Man, there's Jeff Green. So Rusty will not win the Daytona 500 in 2004. Rusty Wallace in his 22nd Daytona 500 trial. He has scored 54 wins at NASCAR's top level. But this race, its biggest, has not been one of them. Well, Kurt Busch is going to get one of his laps back. Elliott Sadler will come back around be on the tail end of all those lead lap cars Labonte be the lucky dog yeah Bobby Labonte hung on with Tony became the lucky dog well, let's see what happened here Marky that the Rusty middle. Wallace just got squeezed in the 42 car Jamie McMurray came up the racetrack right across the left front of uh, Rusty Wallace turned Rusty into the 43 car of uh, Jeff Green and collected trader Ooh, see Johnny Benson there come whistling by in the grass that had to be a hairy ride. That's one of those deals where, you know, most of the time, two out of three of the other cars are just at the wrong place at the wrong time. There's nowhere they could have gone. See, McMurray just had no idea that Rusty was moving up on his outside, and Rusty had to avoid the 42 car. And Now, watch these guys to the right here as Jeff Green spins come whistling through the grass. Yeah, running through the grass, 180 is always exciting. <laughs> oh, there's Yikes. John Andretti. Just barely getting by. On board, Dale Jarrett. He just barely gets by. This is Jeremy Mayfield. And he's going to end up in the grass. Yeah. yeah. This is not good for Jeremy because... Now he got it slowed down a lot before he hit the grass. That was good. All right, here we go. Here they come down pit road. Marty. First stall on pit road for Matt Kenseth, BP. He said it's about as loose as I can stand it at the beginning of the run, but the track is getting slick. Leave it like it is. Four tires, no changes, Dave. Tony Stewart said, I'm loose at times, I'm tight at times. I'm having fun driving this thing. Don't change anything except change the tires and fill it full of fuel. Bill? Just minimal damage on the eight car from that contact with the 97. A little tight, half around out. Wait down the left rear. Junior's on his way to you, Matt. Jimmy Johnson's car was tight. He's not going to beat the 20 off or the eight. They went one round in the left rear, one round out the right rear. A good stop by the 48 guys. And a great stop by Matt Kenseth's team. Looks like they're going to pick him up two spots on pit road and get him out second. So what else is new? Kenseth's crew yeah. picking up spots on pit road? Let's check. We have a camera mounted at the line where they score the cars coming at pit exit. Tony Stewart. There's Matt Kenseth. And now watch this for third. Ooh, got to give it to Little E. Oh, barely. So Junior off third, Jeff Gordon off fourth. Caution for the third time in the Daytona 500. After trouble on the back straightaway. 
these artists. Who can? This is Brian Chase, the Jackman from Michael Waltrip's machine. It's a busy time. Daytona International Speedway, NBC Sports, with live coverage of the 46th Daytona 500. Race under caution for a third time after a three-car accident off of turn number two involving Rusty Wallace, Ken Schrader, and Jeff Green. As we watch again here, watch 42 on the bottom of the screen. He floats up, doesn't know Rusty's there, turns Rusty right into the 43 and collects Kenny Schrader as well. Want to know how frustrated that is? <laughs> yeah, it's Take a listen. <laughs> Uh, we'll get that for you in a minute. We lost a lug nut on the pit stop. Marty? Well, Alan, I'll paraphrase for you. He was upset, very upset. And uh, Schrader, you had a chance to watch the replay like everybody else at home. Did your opinion change at all? <laughs> Rusty, everybody's tight, you know. Not everybody. We're a little bit loose, but it just run out of room. You know, we're back there. Everybody's just kind of in cruise mode. And uh, I guess 40 two gets into the 42 it's a and, then, and then they get the damage into into mike our camera guy. business uh but uh i just gotta apologize schwann this is how we started this thing like in 86 and we'll do better this time but the 42 hits the two who's under the 43 and i'm behind the 43 and here we are sometimes you just run out of room bill uh, on that pit stop, guys, Ryan Newman sustained some right rear damage, and here's what was happening after his pit stall, after his pit stop, rather, he was boxed in, so he backed up. About the time he was going to back up, the 31 behind him decided to leave, so they made contact. A couple of crew guys went down. Everybody's fine. They came back in, bandaged up the right side of the 12 car, and sent it back out. The biggest thing for Ryan here is he's got Buddy Baker working as a spotter on the backstretch, telling him, look, we're just 62 laps into this thing. Relax, we'll be fine. So Ryan Newman back out in track. We're under caution. The Daytona 500. Just past 150 miles in the Daytona 500. Corvette pace car hits pit road. Tony Stewart, the leader, brings the field up to speed on the restart. Matt Kenzie the second. Earnhardt Jr. third. Jeff Gordon fourth. Jimmy Johnson fifth. Rest of the top ten off the pit lane. Michael Waltrip, Greg Bickle, Brian Vickers, Kevin Harvick, and Dave Blaney. 27 cars on the lead lap. Bobby Labonte under NASCAR rules. Waved by the pace car after that last caution. He was the highest scored non-lead lap car. He gets back on the lead lap with the yellow flag. We generally call that the lucky dog award. He was the lucky dog there. Who's that jumping down there? Is that Ricky Rudd? 21. Dave? And guys, he was racing with leader, his teammate, Tony Stewart. They have two-way radio communication, so he radioed to Tony. Didn't mean to get in your way, buddy, but I wanted to be the lucky dog, and Tony said, that's all right. Got our lead change, maybe. Matt Kenseth looking underneath Tony Stewart. And Junior, who's he going to go with? He's chosen the 17 car. I don't think he could get behind Tony Stewart. I think Jeff Gordon kind of closed the door. And here comes Jeff Gordon and his teammate, Jimmy Johnson in the 48 car. Now, these guys have a run on Tony Stewart. Can they go by Tony for the lead? I believe they'll try. They're sure going to try. They are trying. While you watch this, let's hear from Rusty Wallace involved in that last accident. Rusty in his uh, torn up number two race car back here in the garage. And what happened, Rusty? I tried to pass the 43 between turn one and two. Been following for a couple laps. But just really needed to get past them, making my car real tight and everything. So I passed them down to one and two. Thought I had him cleared off at two and didn't give enough room. I just got my right rear quarter panel in this left front fender and uh, turned us both into the wall, and that was it. He had a good sense of humor about it. He said, I'm beginning to think this racetrack doesn't like me anymore. They have not had too much luck here in the last few years. So Rusty Wallace out. Or at least uh, in the garage with a chance to win over the today. So I thought uh, he'll be trying to come back later on today for championship points. Our singular wireless race talk poll, we asked it earlier, and the number of potentials is getting whittled down. Which of these drivers who has never won the Daytona 500 has the best chance of winning today? Well, Mark Martin without an engine failure earlier. Rusty Wallace was your pick. Now he's been in a wreck. Terry Labonte and Ricky Rudd still in contention. Labonte running 16th and Rudd running 31st. We should change it, baby, to see who's going to be left yeah, running the race be, at the end. Which one will be left? Yeah. Yeah, Ricky Rudd is a lap down. 
Tony Stewart leading that. Kenseth second. The race for third. Earnhardt Jr. and Jeff Gordon there. Eight and 24. And you mentioned that on that last caution, Sterling Marlin gave up fifth position. He came off pit road fifth, then went back in again for another pit stop. And it's dropped him back to 18th position. We'll try and get a follow-up report on what happens to the uh, drive of the 40. Looks like today that high line is struggling, Danny. It's just not working at all. And Gordon finally squeezes down, gets to the inside, and leaves Tony, his teammate, Jimmy Johnson, the 48, hung on the outside. Matt, what about the 24? Jeff Gordon's car was a little loose before that caution. He just could not run on that high side, and it was slowing him, him up. That's exactly what happened during this run. The car's still a little free. He needed to get to the bottom. That's where his car works the best. Unfortunately, he hung out his teammate, Jimmy Johnson, doing so. Boy, you sure did, man. Looking at that pack there, Michael Waltrip really hasn't been at the front of the field most of the day. That's very surprising to me. Michael might be playing a waiting game because Slugger Lavey, Michael Waltrip, anyone you talk to with that car will tell you that they are fast. But you're right, he hasn't challenged for the lead, but that could be by design. Two lap cars there in the middle of these uh, lead cars trying to get through and keep up in the front four. Take a look at the AOL top speed as we come to complete lap number 69 and start lap 70. Who's fastest? 24 car kind of tucked at the end of that lead draft. Jeff Gordon with the AOL top speed. And that's a, a speed of an average all the way around the racetrack, not the speed as they cross the line. Jimmy Johnson in that 48 car really wants to get by the 41 car of Case Mears so he can get down in that bottom line and pick up the draft of those first four cars. It's kind of complicated here for some of the people like Michael Waltrip and Kevin Harvick. you got three cars not on the lead lap right there at the head of these double wide lines. You've got Casey Mears in the 41. you got Ricky Rudd in the 21 and Ricky Craven in the 32. They have every right to be there. Yeah. But these lead lap cars try to keep up with those front four first. Oh, who is that that was pushing Ricky what? Rudd there? Is that Bush? It's Kurt Bush. Woo, he got a run. Got a run. 97 car. Kurt Bush really got a run. Okay, Bush a 21 car right on by. That 97 has shown to be fast. Yeah. Very fast. And what's at stake for him here? He's uh -oh, all trouble. trouble. Contact on Hang the on, guys. It's Hang Michael oh. Waltrip and now Brian Vickers. Oh. Robbie Gordon, 31. The top. Oh, Waltrip's over. 25 got one, into it. That's two. Us. Three times for Michael Waltrip. Well, there's the now, big one the right big there. One. Took a lot. There's a lot of good cars right there. Is that Sterling Marlin in there? 40 cars in it. That's Michael Waltrip's car upside down. Terry Smith. See a uh, movement there at the left side of the car. As we look at it. Caution flag is out, the field has slowed, and the safety and rescue workers already there attending to Michael Waltrip's car and the others involved in this big crash down the back straightaway. And that is, this is why NASCAR slowed these cars down on the caution flag to let the rescue workers get there to attend to these drivers as they've quick got, as possible. They've got, they're so much faster right oh, now than they used to. Oh man, it's unbelievable. And Wally, you know from your experience inside these race cars with all the safety restraints oh. and so on, it's not a big cockpit area that a driver has to move around in, and Michael's not a small guy. No, Michael's a big guy. You've got your Hans on. Michael's got some extra wires connected to the, this helmet because of the camera that he's carrying, like I was yesterday. So there's a lot of things that are connected to you. You can't move. On top of that, you're upside down. It's hard to get the steering wheel off, and then when you let go of the belts, you got to be careful not to fall on top of the steering wheel column. So you got to really try to get your bearings and just if you're not hurt just take your time those guys are there the fire guys are there and if you can just take your time and get yourself unhooked i, I think if you know obviously if the car's on fire you're going to create ways to get out quick but there's brian vickers out of his car jamie mcmurray in the accident driver with the star in his uniform back left of the screen he's out of his car
continues around the Michael Waltrip machine. And also the way the seats are, are around you, the head pieces, it's very difficult for somebody like Michael. If he's okay, the best thing they could do is turn the car over and then get him out, if he's okay. Pit road is open. Let's uh, check on the pit stops, Marty. Alan Matt Kenseth in second place. He said, I need to little bit, be a little bit tighter if I'm going to run up front here. I about wrecked six times that time. Half around down the track bar, Dave. More good news for Tony Stewart's. No chassis changes this time. Four fresh tires, plus the news that Michael's okay. Weber? This should be routine. Four tires for the eight car and fuel. Seem to take a long time on the right front, Matt. The 24 is in. It's going to be a four tire change for Jeff Gordon. His car has started to come to him. Jimmy John and also in service complete. It's going to be close. He's not going to beat the 20 and the 8 off the road. I think Jeff Gordon got there first. Yeah. Good stop. See the rest of the teams exiting pit road after their stops. And the work around the Michael Waltrip car to extricate him from that machine after it turned over at least three times down the backstretch. When the car slid off into the grass, I saw one of the tires leave the machine, and when that rim that was left on it dug into the grass, it just sent the car kind of cartwheeling over on its roof. And, and when you're in a situation like that, you are just a passenger, especially when these cars start turning each other. Here you see, looks like Johnny Sauter slid up in the 30 car into Brian Vickers in the 25, a chain reaction. Yes, that's Michael Tuckins, yes. And Biffle, the pole sitter, did he, looks like he barely got through there. So you see the tire come off of Michael's car, then it got into that grass softened by the rain, and it just dug in, just like we saw Ryan Newman's last year and sent the car over. There's Harvick, yeah. Kevin LePage, Johnny, Johnny Benson, Benson, Terry Labonte, <laughs> saw McMurray and Vickers. Okay, here we go. This might be our best shot. Watch the car at the bottom there. The Blue 30. and yellow car. Slides up right there. Just ever so little contact, which doesn't look like a lot when you're running 185, 190 miles per hour. It's a lot. There's the 15. The mountain right now is going to dig in. There goes one of the tires that Allen talked about. Violent. Very violent. Yeah, when you hit that grass, hang on. And the 30 car, he comes up and just, it's like you said, Wally, another six inches probably would have not been an accident. And it looks like the 30 to me got a little bit loose down there. He got a little bit loose, he corrected, but when he corrected, he slid up the racetrack, and there, unfortunately, there were two cars on the outside of him. So my count, at least 10 cars involved in this accident. And it's hard to tell if he got loose or he pushed up there, but... The end result the, result the same. same, yeah. Michael hit by Robbie Gordon, and then here's the dig. Right yeah. there. Dig. You can see just how high that he throws the dirt as the car goes over. Boy, a couple other cars almost got on their lid, too. That was uh, Kevin LePage in the four car got some air. Now watch this. I think Bibble gets through it without too much damage. Hey, Benny, he just said on the radio they should show it from my onboard. Stay low. We are. Wow, that come is on, amazing. Come on, come on, come on. You all right? How bad is it? Good? That should be the lucky dog. That's right. right. There. <laughs> Robbie Gordon's view. Robbie getting has such a good time of it. Oh, man. That looked like we're yesterday. Done, we're done. My car is killed. He said all this while he's sliding to a stop. Did you hear him say, we're done? Yeah, My I'm car's not... killed? So watch the 30s. He pushes or he gets loose? He gets loose. Gets loose, yeah. yeah. So the back end breaks loose first, and when he's trying to correct and catch it, right, is when he slides up into Vickers, and Vickers pinches Waltrip, and off they go. Let's add a couple of more to this. How about 12 cars in this accident now? You get all the numbers and the cars coming back around damage. This is Ryan Newman. Yep, he, he was almost through it. 25 car with Vickers came down and just tagged him. Page in the air, Sterling Marlin up under him. There's Benson in the 09. And like I said, there's just no place for you to go a lot of times. It's just... It's on board Michael Waltrip and... Guys, 25 got into us. That's us. 
Uh, they are talking to Michael. The safety workers are. But we talked about the tight cockpit and Michael being a big guy. He's just trapped inside the car. That's right. I mean, turn the thing over. Uh, or, I, I or think, cut the roll cage out. I, I think probably the reason they don't turn it over BP is if he does have any kind of injury, especially to the neck or the back, that's the last thing you want to do. That's probably a good idea, yeah. So precautions being taken to extricate Michael Waltrip from his machine. And while we continue to monitor that, let's check with Marty. Brian Newman uh, hammering on the 12th car right now and said that he would rather talk. He just wants to calm down for a second. Uh, very upset about what happened out there. And sometimes, BP, as you know, you can use a hammer to take out some frustrations, can't you? Yeah, hit that fender, Ryan. Hit it hard. Hit Marty. Yeah, hit yeah, Marty. Yeah, I would rather you hit me. <laughs> of course, Ryan Newman. They got the car up on its side and looks like they're flipping it over. All right, now, don't let it hit so hard. Oh, no man. way you're going to stop that. And you see they continue to work. Wow, look, look at the heavy damage to that machine. So they continue to work to get Michael Waltrip out of his car. Again, though, the report from NASCAR is that he is talking to the rescue workers there. And uh, a big list. Wow. Man, involved man. in this accident. Well, we talked about earlier, it's not if, it's when. So in this case, the big wreck happened at lap 72 of the 200 scheduled in today's Daytona 500-mile race. And the defending 500 winner played an unfortunate starring role. See a uh, number of different... Uh, rescue crews there the tow trucks to remove all the vehicles involved in the accident the uh, EMTs and the medical workers the firemen and the extrication tools and that's inside Michael Waltrip's car well, Michael's Why? probably he's getting, out. getting out of the car now Michael's crawling out of that thing good but you can see every see everybody see how close everything yeah. is in there, very confined. Plus you got the roof on you. The dash is all crushed on you. The people in the back can see that and listen to the huge applause that Michael gets as he gets out and waves to the crowd. It's a good sign. Take the stretcher and put it back. We don't need it. So not the kind of day Michael Walter hoped for, certainly, in this Daytona 500. He was Hoping to come away with his name inscribed on the Harley Earl Trophy for a third time as a 500 winner. Instead, he's going to be on every 11 o'clock sportscast tonight with the uh, spectacular flyer through the infield. That's, that's a roof cam. Watching all these guys pick the debris up. Trouble off turn two involves 12 cars and sends Michael Waltrip for a flying tumble. Caution flag is out in the 46 Daytona 500. Frightening, scary moment. Fortunately, Michael Walter out of his car and was just fine. As we come back to the Daytona 500, you see the remains of Michael Waltrip's car being hauled away. The most important part to note, that center cage area. You see from the window, the door in the window area, the front and back, if that crushes, that's fine. But that center cage where the driver sits, Benny and Wally, that's the heart of the safety of a race car. And we can see the integrity is still there and protecting Michael Waltrip. Especially for somebody like Michael's size. He's about six foot five. Yeah. Camera still works. You talked about uh, flipping that car back over, BP. This was the view. <laughs> Upside down, right side up. Okay, now we take the wheel off and see about getting out of this car. Just look at the dirt on the dashboard. And yeah. Remember Ryan Newman told us on Countdown to Green the piece of sod he ended up with in his car after his flip last year that he took home with him. McDonald's sponsors a championship, a contest for pit crews throughout the season. Teams who spend the least amount of time on pit road. It's called the McDonald's Pit Crew Championship. Fueled by Power 8, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s team was the victor a season ago. And the teams will be contesting for that race within a race throughout 2004. Just had a round of pit stops here. You saw that uh, Jeff Gordon won the race off the pit lane. Now all the teams will be running down to the Sunoco gas station to get some more fuel for the next round of pit stops. 
Sunoco just one of the new things in NASCAR racing in 2004. Good to have him aboard. You know, my dad, when he raced back in the late 1960s at a local track up in Massachusetts, I was just uh, talking this morning, had a big Sunoco decal on the car. The local Sunoco dealer used to give him gasoline. That's what a sponsorship was in those days. <laughs> Marty. Wild ride for a lot of drivers, including Brian Vickers. What started all that, Brian? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think the 30 car may got loose or something um, and got into us, and I got into Michael, and it just kind of went from there. I, I hate it for everybody. I, I really hate it for uh, the GMAC Chevy team. They, they worked their butts off. It's the best car we had all week. We went from 35th to the top 10. We were running top 10 there the last part of the, uh, the race we were in. Um, but the guys did a great job. I can't thank them enough. I want to thank the president for coming today and all the support we have from the fans out here. When all that happens, what's your view? What's my view? What do you see out the windshield, anything? Hold on, I see a lot of smoke, a lot of dirt flying, a lot of cars, and uh, it usually hurts pretty good, but I'm fine now. Uh, I got a couple, a little bit sore, but other than that, it's just hold on and, and, and let go of the wheel. <laughs> he feels fine, but he's only 20 years old. Remember that too, Dave. Marty Sterling Merlin drove his car in. Uh, what was your view of the, of the wreck there? I don't know, we all ran each other on straightaway. Somebody got into somebody in front of us up there, and uh, Saints of Smoke and everything looked good, and. You know, I was going good and straight. Somebody hung me in the right rear and turned me head on in the fence. So uh, I don't know what time to do all that. It's, this car is too tight. They need to cut the spoiler off and make them a little loose. Everybody's pushing, and uh, if you get three deep, the front end just takes off on them, and it's nothing to do about it. So uh, they need to look at these rules and uh, cut some of the spoiler off and uh, let us get them hung out sideways. All right, Sterling Marlin not able to win his third Daytona 500 today, guys. Still cleaning up on the back straightaway, so let's take a break. We're approaching 200 miles. In the 46th Daytona 500, a dozen cars involved in the big wreck on the back straightaway. Michael Waltrip, I don't think any question about it, got the worst of the whole deal. Chevrolet Corvette, official pace car of the 2004 Daytona 500, hanging a left and getting out of the way. Caution period is over. Jeff Gordon leads the field to the restart as the race reaches 200 miles. Let me correct one thing I said before. Kevin Harvick was not in that wreck on the back straightaway. I mistook his car for Sterling Marlins. So Harvick still running well in seventh place. A lot of shoving right there. 20 car shoving. 24 of Jeff Gordon. And while we watch the cars come up to speed, let's go to Marty Snyder. Well, Michael Walter, you look a little dirty, but uh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Just unfortunate. I was on the outside, and the I survived one rookie being on the inside of me, but I guess when the second one decided to dive in there, it was uh, too much. They got together and pinned me into the wall, and uh, that grass down on the back stretch is just real, real dangerous. Feel, you know, you hit it and it's it a scary ride. I mean, I know it is. Is it, is it quiet like everybody says when you're upside down like that? No, nah, it was pretty hard bounces off the road. And then when the car stopped, I was pinned uh, way bad. I felt like one of those dudes at um, Mirage at the Le Cirque or whatever it is. I was in a box and I couldn't get out. And I didn't appreciate the way the safety workers were going about it. So I was trying to tell them just to turn the car over. You know, I just flipped 10 times or five times or two times. I don't know how many times. 180 and survived it. All they had to do was set it back over and I could get out. They were cutting bars. The whole car was on top of me. I don't know what bar they thought they were going to cut that would have alleviated the paint, the hole I was in. But my brother told me the other day that um, all the great ones have flipped at Daytona. Um, that, I guess I'm one of them now. How frustrating was it to be pinned in like that, Michael? Well, you know, racing cars is not the most not the safest thing maybe at times it's not even the sanest thing you do so you understand you're going to get in some binds and uh, you don't worry about what you get yourself into you look forward to people helping you get out of it and i couldn't see where they were doing a whole lot of good to get me out so uh, i was trying my best to explain to them what needed to happen and what did they eventually do after me screaming and yelling for 10 minutes they flipped it over and i got out so uh, i hope that was a lesson learned we'll take a dirty michael walter as long as he's a healthy michael walter michael just fine so Michael's chance to win a third Daytona 500 is over for this day after the frightening crash down the back straightaway. You've been watching the pictures. You've seen Johnny Sauter's 30 car smoking after the restart. Looks like a tire was rubbing one of the fenders. Jimmy Johnson looking for a spot on Dave Blaney. 48 and 23 might backfire. Johnson losing some ground instead. That 30 car, Matt. Johnny Sauter had a fender rub for over a lap.
lap and a half, and finally it cut into the tire. He says, now I've got a left rear going down. So they'll bring the 30 car to pit road. Second place. Dale Jr., Tony Stewart, side by side instead of nose to tail like they've been all day. And here comes Greg Bickle. Three wide in the 16. Uh oh, Earnhardt Jr. stuck in the middle in the eight car. Jimmy Johnson for the lead on his teammate, Jeff Gordon. And boy, they have completely split. Nobody's going to go up there and help, not at the moment. There goes Harvick, though. Lead. Three abreast of two. And I tell you what, Dave Blaney ran so well last Saturday in the bus shootout. It continues today. Terrific run for that white 23 car. Right there. And that's a team build that is. Oh, that's squeezing it down there in front of the eight-car Dale Jr. <laughs> Whoa. Okay, I'll let you finish the thought of the 23, Bill. Yeah, I was, I was holding my breath there, but uh, Alan, just two minor air pressure adjustments on that car all day. Philippe Lopez calling the shots for Bill Davis Racing. It's been a great day for Dave Blaney. And Benny, like you were talking about, he wants a little better finish today. Yeah, he did not get it last Saturday night. And you know, this is a team that this may be their last race. That's where I was going, BP. This team is not scheduled to show up at the race in Rockingham, North Carolina next Sunday. The sponsorship that's on the side of their car here is for this Speed Weeks only. They don't have backing for the rest of the season. Not planning on going next week. I talked with Crew Chief Philippe Lopez this morning. Ripple and Gordon side by side. And each one of these guys, dressed, I mean, they just want to get behind Jimmy Johnson and get in single file. How about this 16 car, BP? Greg Ripple told you when we talked to him via the radio on the pace laps, he thought he had a good enough car to get from the back to the front. That's good. what he told Bill and I this morning. See Jimmy Johnson trying to give the 24 car, Jeff Gordon, some help. Gets up to the high side, gives him some help drafting, but now he left the bottom open. And Greg Biffle is going to fill it. And Biffle, he said, as long as he had somebody behind him pushed him good, he'd be okay. And he's got one of the best right now in the eight. Let's get more on Greg Biffle from pit lane. Hey, Alan, uh, Benny, Benny, remember how he found out that he was going to the back of the field? He was in the rain delay for the Bush race watching television, and a friend called him and said, hey, you're going to the back of the field. You're not, you're not going to start on the pole. He goes, that's impossible. He goes, then, so then he saw it on, during the rain coverage that he was going to start at the back of the field. That's a heck of a way to find it out, Dave. When we started the show talking about how the damaged 20 car was prepared prepared to make this field but we didn't talk about how the slow 20 car became the fast 20 car i talked to greg zibidelli later in the week about the change the transformation they had made on this 20 car greg said i went back to our library of notes i read everything we'd ever done at any restrictor plate track talladega and daytona every year and i studied and we changed and we came up with a solution guys you just don't pick up time at daytona like the 20 car picked up this week it's amazing the transformation that has taken place. Last Sunday in qualifying, I made the statement, unless they pick up the speed, they will not win the Daytona 500. But in that seven days of college, they obviously found enough speed, they can win the Daytona 500. We heard from Michael Walter, Ben Brian Vickers, Robbie Gordon, and Jamie McMurray involved in that last accident, also treated and released from the infield medical center. You heard from Sterling Marlin, and you saw Ryan Newman drive their cars into the garage and getting them worked on there. 11 laps from halfway in the Daytona 500. Our Napa Field summary. Dale Earnhardt Jr. has led the most laps today, though not in front now. Those who have led among the six drivers, Earnhardt Jr., Tony Stewart, Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, Kevin Harvick, and Kyle Petty led some laps under that last caution. Four yellow flags, the five retired from the race, include Michael Waltrip's Napa machine, Ryan Vickers, Casey Kane, Jeff Burton, and Mark Martin, the latter three all with early engine troubles, and took them out of this Daytona 500. <laughs> by Greg Biffle. What a performance by Tony Stewart's team. Remember? Oh, look at that. Sorry, right, Derek. <laughs> That's okay. Boy, that 48 car got a run, and 
Oh, he's going to get hung out. I don't know. I think Hart, ooh, a little loose there with Biffle down on the bottom. His car got a little sideways on him. That's going to cost him a little bit. He told me that his car is bottoming out the front cross member. Oh, some ooh, trouble ooh, there. Ooh. Got in the left rear of the 48. He told me that his car is bottoming out down between one and two, the front cross member. That's probably what happened to him there, Wally. Well, I'll tell you what, he better not do that with somebody on his bumper or he's going to be sideways because... If, you're, if Dale Jr. was like that, when his car bottomed out, that car will turn sideways. NASCAR Race Control just delivering a message via the pit road official assigned to Greg Biffle's team about blocking. Blocking? Good morning. And they just told Biffle on the radio, just go run some laps, Greg. Just run some laps. He's got Dale Earnhardt Jr. stuffed right up under his rear bumper right now. started talking about Tony Stewart's team before we did the ooh, ooh, ooh thing. What a job by this team. Tony Stewart's car damaged in a crash in yesterday's final practice. They had to take it into the garage area, spend until about 5.30 last night rebuilding the fenders, then come in early this morning, rebuild the suspension on the right side of the car. They put it on the racetrack without turning a lap. And the threat of that is that because of the aerodynamics on these big tracks, they try to get the fenders fitting as tightly around the tires as they can, but it's easy to go too far and have the fenders where they rub on those tires. Crew Chief Greg Zipinelli told me this morning they were concerned about that. Obviously, they've done it to perfection. Well, I guess so. And I'll tell you what, you know Biffle wants to get out front bad. And I think what he would like is to have his spotter come by and radio down and say, Earnhardt will go with you if you want to go. Because he's going to need help. in the Daytona 500. It's been a pretty exciting race so far. I feel safe in saying the best is yet to come. NBC Sports live coverage of the Daytona 500. From Daytona Beach, Florida, glorious afternoon. 200,000, including the President of the United States on hand. And watching a pretty good stock car race with Tony Stewart leading. A lot of lead changes so far. And a very heavy fight for the race lead. Rick Jr. right now in the 8 car. The white 8 is backing up to the 48. See if those two guys can get together and make a run on this front two. 12 lead changes today among six drivers in the inaugural championship race for the new NASCAR Nextel Cup Series. New series sponsor getting a pretty good inauguration today. Yeah, I just can't think the 48 can hang there, Benny. See Jeff Gordon taking a look right now. I don't know if uh, Jimmy Johnson can run that bottom line like the eight car of Dale Jr. I talked to Brian Watson this morning and also Chad Canouser, crew chief on the 48. You'd think that the 4824, the chassis would be identical, right? Totally different. Oh, I know. I, I, totally different. I drove there. BP. All the cars were different. BP, I know you've missed this. You had a little time off at the holidays. I know you've missed this. Yeah. It's time. Cue the duck. Up that way. Time for the AFLAC NASCAR Next Hell Cup trivia quiz. And this won't be much of a quiz for BP. Who led the fewest laps in winning the Daytona 500? I know, I know. <laughs> Go ahead. That'd be BP. Yes, All right. it was. Want to tell us the story? Well, actually, the, it was the last two laps that I took the lead. Uh, Pearson spun coming off turn two on the 190, 198. 198. And so I led those two laps, and I don't know why I led those other two. So we were doing pit stops earlier guess. in the race. You started way back in 32nd that day. Benny Parsons, 1975. Mm -hmm. Daytona 5, 100. Winner in a race for third place. Yes, 48. And just when I said he couldn't run the bottom, he passes on the bottom. I think Junior backed up a little bit too much to get that run. He's going to get three guys lined up now. Jeff Gordon. Oh, Dave Blaney. Now, who's that jump down below? That's Kurt Busch. Kurt Busch. not on the lead lap. He's not on the lead lap. And he's has a fast race car right now. And he is in position to get back on the lead lap if the caution comes out. He's the first car not on the lead lap in scoring. We haven't had a chance to do this yet in this very action-packed Daytona 500, but let's do it now. How about a top 10 through the field? We start with the race leader, Tony Stewart, and Dave Burns. Well, BP led that one lap. It looks like Tony Stewart may lead a lot of laps this afternoon. Remember, Alan, uh, one thing that you mentioned with that repair, one thing you didn't mention, was just how far the rear end of that car was knocked over. Six inches, Greg Zipadelli told me. That's a lot anywhere, especially here at Daytona. Bill? Greg Biffle wanted to follow the 20, so he tried to fall in line. He's going to try and latch onto his bumper and trapped around this two-and-a-half-mile track. Was the pole sitter. Had a start at the rear of the field. Currently second, man. Two-hander teammates, Jimmy Johnson and Jeff 
Jeff Gordon running third and fourth. Jimmy says his car is back to almost neutral after that significant chassis adjustment. A few stops ago, just a fresh stick of gum. Meanwhile, Jeff Gordon says his car is running very well right now. No complaints. He's just riding in traffic, Bill. Dale Earnhardt Jr. lost a few positions trying to battle it back. Planet car tightening up just a little bit as it has a tendency to do late in the run. Look for them on pit road around lap 110. Just an outstanding run for the 23 car of Dave Blaney. Allen told you the story, the sponsor only for this race. We've had feel good stories of the Daytona 500 that ended after 490 laps. We'll see if Dave Blaney can get the lap 500, okay? Bill, they felt like Dave Blaney's car was actually better than Scott Winters before the race. In fact, Bill Davis said, don't be surprised if the 23 is painted cat yellow and black for Talladega. But right now, they have worked the tightness out of the race car, Marty. And Scott says that car is very strong. Matt, the 17 team has gotten it done on pit road today, but on the last stop, Russ Strupp's jack broke. It took him seven pumps, normally about two pumps, to get the car up in the air. He fell back in the field. Now he's made his way back up to eighth. Dave? Kevin Harvick's car was tight, then it got better, and now his car is running hot. They're going to have to take some tape off the grill. They will make a chassis adjustment to compensate for that, because you only take tape off the grill, it would get tight again. The 38 of Elliott Sadler, well, his car is tight, too. Goes into the corner. Tries to turn the steering wheel, wants to push up toward the wall. They'll need to make a chassis adjustment when he comes in uh, around lap 102 or 103. Alan? Cars at the very front of this pack here in the Daytona 500 as we've just crossed halfway, 250 miles down in the 46th running of the Great American Race. And the leader at halfway has go, gone on the go. last 11 500. Oh, three wide. And Biffle, Biffle pushed or something off turn two and allowed all those cars to get such a terrific run on him. Here comes Blaney. Got to get late on this set of tires. They're going to be making a pit stop here in a couple of laps, according to Dave Burns. Yep. So Biffle loses second, third, fourth, and slides back in line fifth just ahead of Dave Blaney. You know, it's funny, uh, earlier in, uh, in the race, or earlier in the week, a lot of talk about teammates working together. You see Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson lined up nose to tail there. Michael Waltrip, while he was in the race, never really able to get up and work with Dale Earnhardt Jr., but Tony Stewart and Jr. have seemed like very willing partners throughout this day, even though they don't race for the same team. Well, they were teammates in the 24-hour race two Sundays ago, and I think that those guys are pretty doggone special relationship with each other, don't you think, Bill? Absolutely. In fact, it's so special, especially on the track today, Benny, that Earnhardt is going to stay out to lap 111. Stewart cannot run that long. The 8 will pit with the 20. It's the only car they can run with. Third place, driver 8. Try to get around Jeff Gordon in the 24. Boy, Jeff's got no help. He's hung out to dry, as we talk, talk about. He's probably going to get passed by all of these cars unless somebody jumps up behind him. Why don't you keep an eye on the 97 car toward the end of that group. Next to last car on the inside, Kurt Busch. He was two laps down. Remember earlier, he and Dale Earnhardt Jr. clanged off each other, and Kurt had to make a green flag pit stop for repairs. He made up one of those two laps on the racetrack. He's now the first car one lap down. Obviously, he's as fast as the leaders. If he can get back on the lead lap, he could be in the hunt for this win. And we'll wind this thing down through the checkered flag. I'd rather let's do 109 with the 48 and the 24. Why not, Bart? That was, was Robin. So Doug Richard. Doug Richard, the crew chief for Greg Biffle. Matt, what about the 48? VP moments ago, Brad Parrott was down. Climbed the top the Lowe's pit box and was talking to Chad Knauss. Chad really wanted to come on lap 107. Made a deal to come on lap 109 with Biffle. That's the plan, at least. Right now, we see some hands out the window. There's Dale Jr. throwing his hand out the window. I'm not sure what he was telling Greg Biffle, but... My guess is he was telling me I was going to make a pit stop. I'm going to make a pit stop. Don't run over me. Remember the last time they pitted under green? Tony Stewart passed Dale Jr. on the slowdown of the pit lane. Let's see what there happens this time. Stewart, Jr., Biffle. 55 miles an hour is the pit lane speed limit by that cone. 
And some others following him in, including Bobby Labonte, Dale Jarrett, and Ricky Craven. Dave? Crew Chief Greg Zipidelli asked uh, Tony if he needed anything. Tony said, no, nope, just give me the four tires and the fuel. They will send him back out with friends who came in with him. Bill? It'll be four tires for Dale Earnhardt Jr. They'll fill it full of fuel. Again, he wanted to pit with the 20. The 16 latched on with that. So the 16, which was talking about coming with the 24, and the 48 came with the 20 and the 8. So, uh, they may be able to catch him. So now the lead of the race in the hands of Jimmy Johnson. He's coming to the start-finish line as these cars just leave the pit lane. And try to get these restricted engines up to full song. Here comes the leader there, 48 car of Johnson. And it takes forever. Seems like it takes forever again, especially when you look up in the mirror and see the leaders coming to full speed. If you're new to NASCAR, they put a plate between the carburetor and the manifold to restrict the amount of air that goes into these engines in order to control speeds. Otherwise, the cars would probably be doing about 230 miles an hour, and they just fly up into the air too easily. It creates a very unsafe condition. And Michael Walt only turned over, what, three times on the backstretch? Unrestricted, did it probably turned over 30 times. The guys that just came off the pit lane and the lead pack. Let's open up the Home Depot virtual garage. We talk about the restricted engine package and the high speeds here at Daytona. That makes something we call drafting king. When it, that's the air that you see. You can't see, but that's the air as you go down the straightaway. And you see the boy behind the car that our NBC car pulls up behind. It's so much easier to run behind that Home Depot car and run in that void. You're able to drive by that lead car because the back car, literally, the air pushes the front car forward. The big vacuum. And that's the draft that's so dominant here at Daytona. Here come the pit stops for Jimmy Johnson and the other front runners. Dave Blaney hard on the brakes. Kurt Busch coming with the leaders. Jeff Gordon, Scott Wimmer, Kevin Harvick. Most of the rest of this lead pack going to dive in. Stops will come at the conclusion of lap 108. Jimmy Johnson pitting all the way down toward the turn one end of the pit road. Go ahead, Dave. Elliot Sadler's car was tight. The guys will go to the right side, change those tires. Air pressure adjustment to help Elliot's condition. Bill? Blaney had to lock him up and put it right on the pit board side, just what his crew chief wanted. Four tires, fuel, no adjustments, Matt. A clean grill for Jimmy Johnson. A little bit of slow work on the left rear. An air pressure adjustment. His car was still tight, although it had gotten better with the last adjustment. Still tight. An air pressure adjustment for Jeff Gordon. He says when the car bumps past him, he gets really loose. Nice. One pound in the right front, Alan. All right, Matt, here come Stewart. And Biffle and Earnhardt Jr. rolling right past these guys, just getting up to speed off the pit lane. You see, they've been out there with two or three laps with fresher tires, and they're able to run probably a second a lap faster because of those newer tires. Marty? Matt's Kansas car BT is a little bit too loose at the start of the run. A pound out of the uh, right rear tire, a half pound out of the left front tire, trying to tighten it up. He said the draft's getting a little crazy out there right now. Well, he doesn't have any help right now with the lead of pit lane. But when he gets up to speed, he's going to blend into some of that traffic that's coming by him if he, if he can. Well, he's going to have to get up to speed pretty quick. Yeah, if he can catch it just, well, not the first group, but that right. second group, maybe the, uh, the 24 and some of those guys. So John Andretti is now the leader of the Daytona 500, having not made a pit stop yet. Then Jeremy Mayfield, who is not pitted. And then you'll get back around to Tony Stewart. Now, these guys need just to stay in line. Yeah. Just stay in line, three-car draft. There, there's nobody real, real close to them. They're going fast right now. As soon as these guys start racing each other, that group behind them is going to catch them. John Andretti has just been on and off pit road in the one car. Now here comes Jeremy Mayfield to the pit lane for his stop. And that'll turn the race lead back into the hands of Tony Stewart. Mayfield stop, Dave. And Jeremy's been working mostly on arrow all day, guys. That left front, they replaced the whole side of the car, the front of that nose. And then they were thinking about replacing the right front as well, but they've basically been trying to massage that all day. They'll make another four-tire stop here, get Jeremy on his way. 
And Mayfield's got that same problem you were talking about Kenzo having. He's a lone ranger right now. Now these guys are around about the same time there. BP Stewart, 47-8, and then Gordon in that second pack, 47-8. Yeah, so but there's a huge gap of about 100 yards between the two groups. You're right. Well, hey, those three guys just stay in line. Have another great pit stop, and they can de decide the Daytona 500 amongst the three of them and not let these other guys back in the race. Hey, Benny, that might be a problem for the 16. He has to continually move that car just a little bit out of the draft. He needs to get air into the engine compartment. Continues to run hot. Remember, while we talked earlier in the race, he saw 250 as a temperature. It gets hot if he tucks in for too long. And you're right, Bill. If he does have to do that, and he keeps breaking that draft so it's not really, really tight, that will cause them to go slower, and we're watching it right now. He's weaving back and forth to try to get some air in that radiator to cool that car off. Coming up on 300 miles in the Daytona 500, Tony Stewart, Greg Ripple, Dale Earnhardt Jr. make up the lead draft. Stewart's guys getting the job done on their pit stop, holding on to the top spot in the Great American Race. The Daytona Beach International Airport behind the backstretch of the racetrack. Air Force One departing the premises. The President of the United States on hand to get this Daytona 500 underway and now heading back to attend to the business of the nation. Bill, pretty exciting day for you, huh? Yeah, it was a great day. Uh, I'll tell you who else had a great day is Greg Martin, who's the utility man for the 18 car of Bobby Labonte. He's the senior instructor at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Benny, you did a story on him last year, remember? I in remember. Brunswick, in Brunswick, Georgia. He told me that about 90% of the people on the president's detail have been through his training center. So he knew about 90% of them. He teaches emergency driving techniques to agents and other kinds of things. So it's a big day for him seeing those guys here today. That's fantastic. That was a great piece we did with Greg Martin, Bobby Labonte. Tell you, who's, right. tell you who's got a great piece here is Kurt Busch. Remember we talked about him being the first car lap down. He has pulled the second ah. group up to the lead three and is literally knocking on Earnhardt he Jr.'s is. bumper. And look at how much of a gap Earnhardt Jr. got to close up on the 16 because of that bump. And that Ripple, the last two times, has struggled getting in turn three. I don't know if he's laying back to try to get a run or what he's doing. It looks like he does, BP, because he really catches him right here. Yeah. He just needs somebody to go with him right now if he pulled out. But I think he knows if he pulls out, Dale Jr. is going to go behind the car, Tony Stewart. Wow, Stewart up the hill. Black car, Jeremy Mayfield there. That's why he's going to overtake him. I would not think that if Kurt Busch has caught them with that kind Oh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Gets a run on Greg Biffle for second place with Kurt Busch's push. Yeah, now Busch is going to go with his teammate, I believe. Which is Greg Biffle, and that's exactly what he did. And all those other guys are saying, let's don't help Jr. because his car is too fast. Get him behind us, maybe we'll have a chance. Exactly. I was just, what I, what the thought I started to say is, I can't imagine Kurt Busch. It's been so long since we've had a caution. He's not going to wait on that lucky dog thing. If he can find a way to get a push from Jeff Gordon and some of these other guys up and around Tony Stewart to get on the end of the lead lap, he's going to try it. Well, what he's going to do is he's going to help push his teammate up to the lead. And once he does that, maybe Biffle will give him a little bit of a wave. This car is obviously fast enough. It's not going to hold Biffle up if he lets him go. Jeff Gordon, there's a couple other teammates working against the eight car Dale Jr. That's one thing Dale doesn't have. He doesn't have a teammate out there. He has no friend. This is for third place. Well, Tony Stewart's been his best friend so far yeah. today, but he's separated from him for this last little while. <laughs> Boy, they're all lined up against Dale Jr. on the outside. Harvick drops down. I'll try to help you. While we watch this, let's check out our Levitra top performers. Drivers who have done a lot of the leading today. Tony Stewart led the most laps. Earnhardt Jr. the second most. And they're still very much in contention to win this Daytona 500. Harvick getting into the play here. Another good reason for Biffle to get out front is to get that radiator cooled down. Yeah. Scott, remember, how about that 22 car behind this group hanging on with these guys? Matt? BP back in 2002 when Bill Davis saw his cat dodge win the Daytona 500 and win the Daytona USA. Spent a year there with the confetti and champagne. They wheeled it out and they put it right in their 
showroom with the champagne and confetti still on it. It is still there to this day. They would love to add another one. Rookie Scott Wimmer having a wonderful day. He just dropped from sixth to seventh. Bill told me earlier in the week that Scott was almost playing it too conservative, not wanting to make a mistake, and he still wants to earn a lot of respect. He's certainly doing that here today, having a very cautious but very solid run. Scott Wimmer, one of the rookie drivers from the NASCAR Next Up Cup Series in 2004. A solid drive so far, and Bill Davis is 22. Tony Stewart is the race leader, 300 miles complete in the 46th Daytona 500. Trading positions and almost trading some paint on the lead group as we come back to the 46th running of the Daytona 500 live from Daytona Beach, Florida on NBC Sports. Just past 300 miles, Tony Stewart has been out in front most of this day. Dale Earnhardt Jr. right there with him, now running second after Greg Bipple was shuffled back from that runner-up spot just a second ago. See Biffle kind of hung there in that outside lane. Cars beginning to draft by him. Scott Wimmer in the 22 goes to third. Here comes Kevin Harvick in the 29 to fourth. And, and Biffle's just having a hard time staying in the draft. He probably he can stay in the draft. I think he has a car. But it's just running hot. He's got to get that car out in the air, and that's killing him in the draft. Dave. I'm with Jimmy Fetty, crew chief for the 97. Jimmy, we've seen your car come up through now. If you can get back on the lead lap, can it lead and can it win? Yeah, I mean, we got a pretty good car right there right now. Uh, we had a misfortune with uh, the eight car early on, but uh, let's hope we get a yellow or something to get us back on this lead lap because we got a fast car. All right, one of his guys leaned over to me and said, hey, when you're done with that interview, throw that microphone on the track. We need a caution. <laughs> <laughs> NASCAR just issued a blocking warning to Tony Stewart a couple of laps ago. And we'll show you why. Greg Biffle got a little run at Stewart for the race lead off the start-finish line tri-oval. And, wow, got a heck of a run. And that's the move he was trying to work up to. He wanted to pass him in the tri-oval. Then he got out of line. Tony wouldn't let him by. And then he started losing spots. That will help in that outside lane. 97 for Kurt Busch. You just heard from his crew chief Jimmy Fennick there running the first car one lap down. Unfortunately, in 20th place. Oh, the car is fast. Been a while since we had a caution. Last one was at lap 72. For that big mess in the back straightaway. And here comes Wimmer. Let's don't forget about that 22 car. You're talking about blocking and NASCAR issuing a, a warning. It's, it's a very, very fine line between putting a successful defense of a position on someone and blocking them and causing a wreck. Okay. And that, well, I mean, you know, from a driver's perspective, it's a very fine line, right? Well, it is, but, you know, th that's one of those things that you just have to do here as a driver is you have to drive in your mirror as much as you do at the windshield because of the type of racing you have. And, and what you're saying is you don't want to get into situations where you put on a block and put the guy up in the wall when you do that. So, yeah, you're right. It is a fine line, but you have to do it. So now the uh, two drivers that have really worked fairly successfully together in the draft all day, Tony Stewart and Dale Earnhardt Jr. lined up once again one and two. With Scott Wimmer, Kevin Harvick, and Greg Biffle now rounding out the top five. Anything happens, we'll come back live. For now, you're watching NASCAR on NBC. 68 laps to go in the 2004 running of the Daytona 500. Tony Stewart leading Dale Earnhardt Jr., Scott Wimmer, Kevin Harvick, and Greg Biffle. None of those drivers have ever won the Great American Race before. A couple things to update you on. Some drivers who were involved in earlier crashes have come back onto the track. Rusty Wallace, Scott Riggs, Derek Hope, Ryan Newman, and Sterling Marlin are all back in action, as is Jeff Green. Marlin, though, just been shown the black flag by NASCAR for not meeting the minimum speed requirement with his repaired car. And when I saw his car come down Fed Road, I realized he was not going to meet yeah. the minimum. All he was trying to do was just get a few more laps. What a day for Scott Wimmer running third, Matt. Scott Wimmer, a rookie, but driving like a veteran and thinking like a veteran. He's managing, he's managing his race. Talking to crew chief Frank Stoddard, they're expecting a pick around lap 140. Frank said, what changes do you want? Scott said, I'm afraid to really mess with it. Let's not change anything. But he knows he has one more stop after the one at lap 140 just
just in case he does need to make an adjustment. Meanwhile, Jeff Gordon and the 48 of Jimmy Johnson, they were both in the top five about 25 laps ago. They both were dropped out, drop kicked back. Gordon trying to work his way back to the front. Jimmy Johnson, he's working on a tight race car right now. You know, as Matt said, it's, it's one thing, too. When you come in, especially when you're a rookie, when you come in, you don't want to change too much on that race car because you don't want to lose the guys you came in with. You don't want to take any more extra time in the pits just in case something goes wrong, you lose that group. The second group headed by Greg Bibble, falling a little bit behind the front three. A couple of seconds now for the front four, I would excuse me. How about the Coca-Cola family of drivers? Faring reasonably well today five in the top 13. I haven't talked a lot about Dale Jarrett and Bobby Labonte, but they are among the 19 drivers on the lead lap. Kyle Petty and Kurt Busch in the top 20 as well. Of course, Michael Waltrip involved in that lightning crash earlier, though he is fine. And Jeff Burton with an early engine failure to put him out of the Daytona 500. 30 car of Johnny Sauter, one of the running wounded around here, trying to to stay out there and make some laps for some next L Cup points. Just, just kind of doing up some numbers here, thinking about pit stops. Um, we're we're going to start to see some more green flag pit stops fairly soon for some of these drivers. Is Jeff Gordon gets a move on Greg Bibble for fifth place, and Dave Blaney in the 23 tries to go with him. I think Pipple's just having to get out of the gas up there. Yeah, he is. He's really been struggling that 16 car. Really I'm tight late. to 16 now, really tight. And something that might be contributing that to that is the wind. We haven't really talked about that, but the wind blowing pretty much directly down the backstretch into turn three. So when they make that left turn, it's kind of a tailwind knocking the back end of the car around here. Which, which just magnifies the problem if you're pushing. Coming soon. Expecting the leaders potentially this lap. All right, the, we've raced 136 laps. They can make a one more stop. You want to get these guys out of the way. You certainly don't want. Looks like the 50 was waving. So Tony Stewart, Dale Earnhardt Jr., the lap car of Kurt Busch, all hugging that inside line. They're coming to pit road. Scott Wimmer hard on the brakes. Oh, Johnny Sauter! Rifling right through the leaders and blowing the pit road entry big time. Greg Biffle also in. Close call for these leaders. Oh, man, was that close. Dave. And trust me, that's frightening from where I stand down here behind the hopefully protective wall. Four tires for Stewart, no changes, full of fuel. They didn't want to change anything. Certainly didn't want to make it any looser, Tony said. Weber? Dale Earnhardt Jr. said his car is the best it's been when he's in traffic, but they want to still try and get him out front. Major chassis adjustment, Matt. They were concerned about possible damage that right front fender. It was fine. A four-tire change. He's not going to beat out the 20. They made a half a pound air pressure adjustment out of that right rear. Dale Earnhardt Jr., though, kind of separated there. See Stewart, then Kurt Busch, the lap car, then Wimmer, and then a gap. Back to Dale Jr. Here's Jeff Gordon on pit road, Dave Blaney, Kevin Harvick, Joe Nemechek now among the lead group. In the Army car. And now Johnny Sauter coming in to serve a penalty for that little blast through pit road a minute ago, Dave. Kevin Harvick brings a 29 in. They didn't get all the tape off the nose they wanted to last time. He was running hot, but not too hot. They'll take some more off this time. Four tire change, no chassis adjustments. Matt, on the previous lap, Jeff Gordon keeps Mike and said the eight is pitting, the eight is pitting. What do we want to do? Robbie Loomis said stay out for a few more laps. A four tire change. Again, Bill, no adjustments for Jeff Gordon. The 23 of Dave Blaney drag races the zero. 1 off of pit road. Cars just a little bit tight all around. Fuel four tires. He's off of pit road. John Andretti, Ward Burton, Brendan Gaughan, and Kyle Petty also hitting on this lap. Now here come Matt Kenseth, Jimmy Johnson, and Elliot Sadler, all lead lap cars. Marty? Not a good sequence for the 17 team. He was supposed to pit with Jeff Gordon. Jeff tricked him, so Matt had to stay out on the track, killed all of his momentum. Then he overshot a stall to be pushed back. Four tires and a track bar adjustment for the 17, Dave. Elliot Sadler radioed in. The car's going arrow tight. It feels like there's a shock broken or something. Big chassis adjustment for Elliot. Matt? Big chassis adjustments also for Jimmy Johnson up on the track bar. Also a wedge adjustment. His car still very tight. You can see donuts down the side. It looks more like it's been running Martinsville. 
Bobby Labonte, Dale Jarrett, Casey Mears, Ricky Rudd also leaving the pit lane. Having just come on for service with that group of cars. Look at the gap from Scott Brimmer back to Dale Jr. As a result of that pit exchange. And there goes Jr. and Biffle by the 24 car of Jeff Gordon. Gordon is going to be able to hook on to these two. Now, these three cars might be able to chase down Jimmy Johnson and that group. I mean, I'm talking Tony Stewart and that group. So the lead is going to go back to Tony Stewart here as these pit stops cycle around. Kyle Petty has just come in to serve a penalty. Dave? Well, now I don't know what happened. He came in the pit stall, then he went right back out on Kyle Petty. His car has been good all day, guys. My notes all the way down the list. Re uh, reads no changes to the chassis all day long, and apparently there will be a penalty because he took that catch can with him. Yeah, he had pitted on the previous lap and apparently took some equipment out of the box, and that's a penalty. So Kyle has just come in and served it, and that's going to hurt. A stop and go is a huge penalty when you have to come in at 55 miles per hour, stop, and then take off again, and still stay 55 miles per hour. So through a round of green flag pit stops for the lead lap cars, it spread the front pack out a little bit, but as we saw last time this happened, the second group was able to draft up and catch the first and make it a, a about a 10-11 car race for the lead once again. Yeah, I think a lot of the reason because of that the last time, though, is because Biffle could not stay tight in line because he was trying to cool that car off. But we'll see what happens with the second group. It's got maybe some more cars in it. Bill? Part of the problem with Greg Biffle, he had an equalized left front tire and didn't know it. Oh, man. Let's see. Junior, the last time by, was about three-tenths of a second faster than his three cars in front. So it looks like that Dale Earnhardt Jr., the 8, the 16 of Biffle, and the 24 of Gordon will be able to chase them down. Another penalty on that round of pit stops. Ward Burton held for a missing lug nut. Hmm. So, uh, costly, costly error there. It's dropped him back to 19th place. Well, Jeff Gordon in a bid for a third Daytona 500 win, a 97 and 99 winner of this race, trying to push Greg Biffle and Dale Earnhardt Jr. back up to the lead few. Remind you to log on to NBCSports.com for much more on the Daytona 500 and on NASCAR. BP's favorite to win the series championship this year, the next Dell Cup. And you know, there's been a lot of talk about this new system used to determine the champion, the chase for the championship. I did a little piece on the tracks that will make up that final run to the title in the fall and what you can look for as we get to each one of those later on in the season. NBCSports.com. Tony Stewart. In search of his first Daytona 500 win. Out in front with Scott Wimmer in the 22 running second. The 97 car in the middle is Kurt Busch. He is one lap down. He's been that way for a long time, hoping for a caution flag that will allow him to get back into contention to win this race. 56 laps to go. Another round of pit stops, and who knows what kind of a finish we'll see. Daytona's known for its late race twists. 200,000 people here at the Daytona International Speedway watching the 46th running of the Daytona 500 with Tony Stewart still in the lead. Dale Earnhardt Jr. fighting a handling problem. His car is suddenly 2-3. The fans have gotten their money's worth so far. By the way, took all the hot dogs they sold today and put them end to end, they would circle this two and a half mile track. That's good. They wash it down with about 7,000 gallons worth of soft drinks. So uh, concession stands are busy, and these guys are busy in the car. Tony Stewart trying to hold them off. One more pit stop if we stay green, and it will be very interesting to see what happens then. Gorgeous afternoon in Florida for the Daytona 500. Back upstairs to Alan Wally and Benny. Hey, Bill. Yes, sir. Is there any kind of talk about maybe two tires on this last stop? You gave it away, BP. Yep. Guys are starting to talk about two tires. They've seen how they work on some of the other cars. Depending on where you are and how your car is handling, these tires that some guys were complaining about earlier, you might just want two of them. We'll see what happens. Well, I don't know, Wally. Asking these left sides to run 60-some yeah, laps. That, that is asking a lot, Benny. Dave, Although, if you're, if you're desperate or you got nothing else to lose, go for it. Sorry, Dave. Oh, thank you.
Thank you, Wally. I was waiting for the throw from you. No, okay. not from BP this time. <laughs> hey, guys, there's a whole list of reasons why it's good that Tony Stewart continues to lead. I mean, one, everything, all the action, if there was in the track, will happen behind him. Secondly, if his car was running hot, they told him to watch his temperatures earlier, he's getting all the clean air. But you know another one? Tony likes to concentrate, doesn't like distractions in his cockpit. Everything is taped down, and everyone is quiet because the spotter, no one really has to talk to him about cars around him. Yeah. He doesn't have anybody that's trying him inside or outside, so. Exactly. That, that's the key, is having somebody that will just run with you, that you don't have to be worrying about looking in your mirror and blocking and doing this and that. He's got three guys, four guys behind him. They're all content staying in the line right now, so it's a nice drive. Tell you what, as dominant as, as that 20 car has been today, if Tony Stewart were not to win this race, wow. Guys, take a, take me inside the car. If you're Tony Stewart or you're Scott Rowe you're, you're these other guys, you've been out here racing for a few hours now. Uh, the adrenaline from the, the heavy pack of traffic racing has settled out. You're kind of settled in line. You're trying to figure out what to do for the race. What's going on inside the car right now? I think right now, yeah, everything's calmed down. And if you've got everybody working on the same plan, with it, which is right now, just log laps, stay in line, and when it comes down to the end, whoever is there in line, whether it's five or six of us, we'll sort it out then. You start racing out, getting crazy, you know, you're gonna have the guys way back behind catch up and it'll be a 15 or 20 car race. So I think right now everybody's just content trying to make some laps and just stay in line. Jeff Second Gordon group. on the inside of Junior trying to take a spot away from him. Second group is beginning to catch that first fairly quickly. Oh, wow, Biffle really gave Earnhardt a shot there. Almost turned him a little bit sideways. That's for third, fourth, and fifth positions. Behind the front two plus the lap car of Kurt Busch. Now let's look back to the next pack of cars. And you've got to go a long way to find Jimmy Johnson in the 48, the sixth place driver, Matt. Well, and eight laps ago, Jimmy Johnson's pack was just a three car pack. So his group made a pack with the second pack to try to not get out of line. Everyone just line up so they can get six cars together and maybe chase down that front pack. At one point, they were going to let the 29 of Harvey get in front because they actually feel like his car tows the group faster, but they were afraid the 48 and 29 start jockeying, Dave, it was going to mess up their pack. Matt, the 29 car made no chassis changes, but they finally got the tape ripped off the front of the grill. That was actually to help a loose in condition more than it was overheating at this point for Kevin Harvick. Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s car is a little free. You saw that bump he got from the 16. He said, awesome, that's just what I needed, trying to push him by. Now he's back in traffic. Here we go again. And now see, but with these guys racing now, that backpack is going to make a lot of ground up on him. Earnhardt Jr. to the outside of Scott Wimmer for second. Biffle goes with Jr. And Wimmer, being the rookie that he is, he says, okay, guys, go ahead. I'm perfectly content to be here in fifth or sixth. He has no friends with that yellow stripe on his back bumper that signifies he's a first-year driver. I've been telling all those rookies that yellow stripe means, hey, guys, I don't know what I'm doing. Don't follow me, because very seldom do they follow those rookies. Now Earnhardt Jr. in second, up behind Kurt Busch. Tony Stewart, so continuing to lead. There's Joe Gibbs, the team owner for Tony Stewart. Trying to add another Daytona 500 championship to his long list of accomplishments. You saw on Discover Card Countdown to Green, Marty Snyder's visit with the coach about going back to the NFL at this stage in his life. So he's got another set of championships that he's after, not just the football, but the racing. Yeah, he looks a little, little uh, intense there, doesn't he? Biffle is just pushing the eight car he is to the front. Oh, man, looks like Biffle got in the corner. He was, could not get it turned down the hill, but finally was able to do that. Bernard Jr. Up in front of Kurt Busch, down in front of Biffle. And Gordon is going to try to leave Jeff that hung out. Jeff Gordon's going to try to leave Biffle hung out. And here comes that second group. Jimmy Johnson trying to pull Kevin Harvick and the others. I'll tell you, it'd be hard to walk away from that 97 car if I was looking for some drafting help because he's been awfully strong. Absolutely. 
and then, you're not racing him for position. Yeah, that's it. at this point, Kurt Busch has everything to gain by working with somebody and nothing to lose. 45 laps to go in the Daytona 500, just over 100 miles remaining in the Great American Race. The 46th Daytona 500, live on NBC Sports from the Daytona International Speedway, about to turn 400 miles long. Tony Stewart, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Jeff Gordon, three of the biggest stars of the sport of NASCAR racing, hold down the top three spots as they now enter the final 100 miles of the sport's biggest prize. The third car, the dark car, number 97, Kurt Busch, is as fast as these front two cars, but unfortunately, he had to make an unscheduled stop earlier. He's still one lap down, two and a half miles behind those two cars. There are 17 cars on the lead lap at this point. The field is broken off into two groups of drafting. You've got that front group separated by about seven seconds on the second draft headed by Jimmy Johnson and the second group not making any headway on the first. Gave you the first three, Greg Biffle runs fourth and Scott Wimmer is running in fifth position. Rookie driver out of Wisconsin. Matt Yoakum has more on the 22 team's effort. Wimmer just told his crew chief Frank Stoddard the car is just way too loose to hold it on the bottom. One of Frank Stoddard's key guys is his new race engineer, Derek Finley. Back in 1995, while taking his senior exam for engineering at the University of New Mexico, his cell phone rang. His professor said, I think you should not answer that. I would highly suggest not answering it. He looked down, saw the caller ID, says, I think you're wrong. It's Dale Earnhardt. He walked outside, took the call. Earnhardt offered him a job to be DEI's first engineer. He was there when the one car first went to victory lane, and the success that started with the 8 and the 15. He's bounced around a little bit, but landed here at the 22. The Earnhardt connection is even here in the 22 pit. Scott Wimmer having a terrific day in his inaugural Daytona 500, running in fifth place. They're starting to run across some lap cars, and trying to get around these lap cars might give Junior in that eight car the opening that he needs to get by Tony Stewart. You might be right, BP. Remember how Tony Stewart got in front of Dale Earnhardt Jr. Way back in the very first set of pit stops in this race that came at lap 29, Jr. was leading Tony Stewart when they started slowing down to get the pit road. Stewart went by Jr., then braked for the pit lane. And really, Jr. hasn't been back around him ever since. And if these guys can get through traffic better than anybody else and get, you know, open up the gap between the third and the fourth place car, that's even going to help him. But they want to keep Kurt Busch with them because he's a lap down, he's no threat, he's a fast car, so the three of these cars can leave everybody else. That's what they want. They don't want any competition at the end of this race. Dave, what are they saying about the 97 car? Because he's awfully fast. Well, well, I just wanted to review how they got there. Remember, they had that trouble with Junior early in the race, and they pitted under green on lap 47 and lost that time. But the big break for them was on lap 59 when there was a caution for the wreck with Rusty and Kenny and Jeff Green. They had a chance to come in and fix that right front fender correctly. That's why he's a factor now to help the other guys, and maybe even if he gets his lap back, a factor for the win. Bill? I just asked car chief Tony Uri Jr. how the eight is going to get past the 20 of Tony Stewart. He said, we're going to beat him off pit road. <laughs> and those final pit stops will be coming up fairly soon. Hey, you know what, Bill? That was it's interesting you brought that up with the 97 the 8 because if the 97 is still mad with the 8 and it comes down to the end, 97 might go with the 20. You know, some of the conversation on these radios have been good, Wally, but they did tell some of these guys, if you push that 8 across the finish line, it makes you a very popular driver. <laughs> yeah. Bernhardt yeah. <laughs> Jr., winner of the most popular driver award. He's got a lot of fans here in the Daytona Beach in these stands. A little separation here for those top two, weaving through some lap traffic. Now this is the most separation we've seen all day between the second and third place cars. We Jeff Gordon trying to go by Mike Skinner, the lap car. Also another lap car. And Kurt Busch in the 97 has fallen off those, that front two a little bit. If he falls back to Jeff Gordon, he might be able to take those Jeff Gordon back up in contact with the front two. You know, it seems like Gordon's car might even be better when it's not in a big group of cars because he gets kind of hung out or he falls back and all of a sudden he works his way back up. But it seems like when he's in a pack, he has his hands full. 
Still a few laps away from those pit stops. Let's take a break. We'll come back in time for what should be critical final stops to pit road. Back at Daytona International Speedway, here come the leaders to pit road. Dale Earnhardt Jr. trying to pull a reverse on Tony Stewart and outbreak him to the pit lane. Greg Biffle, Jeff Gordon, Kurt Busch, Scott Wimmer in. These stops coming in the final laps of the Daytona 500. Dave? Tony Stewart's car is just a hair loose. He has for just a little bit more air pressure in the right front to tighten up that car. Bill, Tony Urey Jr. told his crew on the radio it's showtime. It's four tires and fuel for the eight to come around to the left side. Matt. Jeff Gordon trying to win his third Daytona 500. They put a half a pound of air pressure back in it. They took out in the last stop. The 22 car is going to be the 24 off pit road, as does the 20 and the 8. Two tires on the 22 car, Matt. Get you to confirm that for us, but I'm pretty sure I saw Scott Wimmer leave with just two tires. Two tires on the 22 car. No adjustments. All right, so Frankie Stoddard, Scott Rimmer's crew chief, going to roll the dice on the tire strategy. But he has no one to work with him. He's by himself. And when these guys get to a VP, they're going to say bye-bye. Just blow by. Here comes the second group of cars then. Jimmy Johnson, Kevin Harvick, Joe Nemechek. All from that second lead pack down the pit lane. Marty? Joe Nemechek's had a great run in a car that's very good. Pitting with Kevin Harvick. It'll be a four-tire stop to the 0-1. Dave? Four-tire stop for Kevin Harvick. No chassis changes. Car is not running hot. They need to get the left side on quick, Matt. And the 48 is in. Remember, that slow pit stop cost them last time. He is now down and away. He will be going out with a 29. And Greg Biffle's chance to win the Daytona 500 is gone. He's on pit road to serve a penalty for speeding, coming in for his pit stop last time by. Unless the caution comes out and allows him to catch up to the pack. Sorry, Greg. Yeah. will have to wait till next year. And we saw when he made his entry on the pit yeah. road, all the ground that he made up, you knew that he was too fast, and the NASCAR officials did not let it pass. So Scott Wimmer's team takes just two tires. He's well clear of these two, Tony Stewart and Dale Earnhardt Jr. <laughs> but when they get to him, they're going to be going fast. Wimmer now the leader with 29 laps to go. Here's Frankie Stoddard watches him go by. Here's the cars coming on the pit road just a moment ago. There we see Jr. tries his best to get in front of Tony Stewart. Can't quite make it. You look at Biffle up there. He just passes all these cars as he entered pit road. Look at the ground he made up. And that's obviously speeding. Yeah. He was locked up. No kidding. Yeah. So the pass-through penalty for Greg Biffle has dropped him down to 14th place, 27 seconds behind leader Scott Wimmer. Now, these two drivers, Tony Stewart and Dale Earnhardt Jr., are second and third, 2.6 seconds behind Scott Wimmer. The problem for Wimmer is he's out there all by himself. There he goes, and here come these yeah. two cars with the lap car of Kurt Busch all tucked up in the draft. Guys are about a half a second to three quarters of a second a lap faster than Scott Wimmer, who's sitting out there by himself. So he's really a sitting duck. And Frankie Starter, the crew chief on this 22, that's exactly that shot we saw. He was saying, man, why did I do that? I'm a sitting duck. Why didn't I change two tires and get with these guys? showed you earlier our uh, Home Depot virtual garage how the cars tuck tightly together in the draft here at Daytona basically break the air more efficiently than the one car running by itself and are faster and there's the gap from Wimmer to Tony Stewart and you can watch the interval shrink in our real-time telemetry and that thing Scott's going to have to worry about is that car's handling is not going to be as good with two tires on it so he's going to have to use a lot more racetrack than the three cars that are behind him right now if Scott Wimmer the 22 had just a Another car do the same strategy and get hooked up together. It's great strategy. But exactly. by yourself, no good. Dave? And BP, that's what happened to Jeremy Mayfield on Thursday's 125-mile qualifier. They had made deals with other guys to take only two tires, but then everyone bagged them. And as we saw on Thursday, everyone closed in on Jeremy, and then it, they passed him. They blew right by him. Same thing, potentially, for Scott Wimmer here. Another guy that's out there all by himself is Jeff Gordon. Scott Wimmer 
Now down to just eight tenths of a second is lead, Matt. We've talked a lot about gambling. Frank Stoddard, two tires. Very gutsy call. Well, I mean, it was a pretty easy call. You know, we were uh, we were at the back of that line right there. Uh, you know, we're, we're just here to get a top 10 finish. I'd like to win the Daytona 500. I wasn't going to win the Daytona 500. The, the team wasn't going to win it. Caterpillar wasn't going to win it by uh, putting on four because, you know, even if we had a great pit stop, chances are that we weren't going to beat both of them out. Uh, that was our chance to try to win it. They got a heck of a draft off. We're probably going to be in a little bit of trouble. But it's been a heck of a show on all day. Scott's done a great job. The team's done a great job. And, uh, you know, heck, well, you never know. Maybe we'll hold them off. Okay, go on back up. BP, we talked about it earlier. Three cars is faster than one. Oh, yeah. And Scott Wimmer was by himself. These three cars hooked up. And now, can he stay in front? Frank said, maybe we can stay in front of him. He's he has shown some speed, but with two tires, I doubt it. I don't think so either, Benny. Maybe he'll stay a little while, but he was bobbing and weaving for all yeah. the good. Trying to put the block on Tony Stewart. Eventually, he'll be sliding up the racetrack. He'll leave that bottom open, and those guys will drive underneath him. Maybe right now. Right now? Okay. Wimmer up the hill off turn number two. Here comes Tony Stewart for the lead. Wimmer to block. But I don't think it's going to work. Looks just like Wally World, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't we do this once before? So Tony Stewart reclaims the lead in the Daytona 500. I'll tell you what, the key to this whole deal right now is that 97 car. Who he, go? who he goes with. Bill, what are they saying about the eight? I think the eight needs some help, doesn't he? Uh, he's in pretty good shape right now. He just wants the laps counted down. Wally, you know, after the twins on Thursday, Tony Urey Sr. was very disappointed that Michael Waltrip didn't work with him and made a comment to that effect after the race. Well, Dale Earnhardt Jr. went to the media center and was immediately asked about the comment. Only he thought Tony Urey Jr. made it. So he stormed out of the media center, went back to the garage, and got in a confrontation with Tony Urey Jr. What are you saying? What are you saying? Well, Dad just stood in the corner and watched and laughed. You Jr. was apologizing for something he didn't even do until Dad walked in and said, it was me that made the comment. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> you know who the most popular spotter up there is right now? Kurt Busher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our Budweiser aerial coverage of this Daytona 500. Looking down on the drivers who will decide the win among them. Tony Stewart, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Scott Wimmer hanging on to the lead draft. But the man in the third running car in line, Kurt Busch, who is one lap down, been with these leaders for a long time now. And the spot that you're, that you're talking about is Jeremy Brickhouse, the nephew of Richard Brickhouse, who won the first race wow. at Talladega. Wow. Will he be able to push Dale Jr. by Tony Stewart for the win? <laughs> will he be able to, and will he? That's right. i tell you, the spotters will all have a little meeting. One will have a Home Depot jacket on. <laughs> One will have a Budweiser jacket, and then there'll be the Sharper jacket, and they'll all be in huddle. Spotters, of course, position high atop the grandstand, atop the towers here at Daytona to look and help their driver around the racetrack. Spot trouble ahead. Communicate back and forth with the driver. You are looking at Kurt Busch's spotter. <laughs> Let's make a deal in progress. That's Dale Jr.'s spotter there, Stevie Reeves. It's talking with Rick House. So they're all ready to get <laughs> yeah. It wasn't going to take long. Hey, guys, I'm with Jimmy Fenning down here on the pit box. You appear to be the key to this whole thing. Uh, any great deals yet? You know who you're going to go with? Well, the eight car wanted to come and uh, ask for some help, but uh, we also got to remember he's the one who got caused us two laps down. So, I know it's Kurt's shop out there. He's driving that car. We're not. Uh, drivers and teams never forget, do they, Weber? Jimmy Fennick said you just paid him a visit. Well, what were you talking about with Jimmy Fennick, Tony? Oh, we just got a few jokes. <laughs> a few jokes? Did you ask for a little help? Uh, I just went down and had a conversation with him, see, uh, see how they felt about the end of this race. So uh, we'll see what happens at the end. Okay. He's smiling now, but he wasn't when he came back from the 97. Yeah, I bet not. I bet not, Bill. <laughs> 
Well, we're down to it. The final 50 miles of the Daytona 500. Nice yeah, up to the main. No fuel necessary to make the finish. You know, one thing you were talking about earlier about, well, you know, it's popular to push Junior across, but I'll tell you what, you still got to face your crew guys. And if you're in the 97, and go, man, that's a guy that put us two laps down. That hurts in a tough position right now. We're seeing the top three plus the lap car of Kurt Busch. Now look at the gap back to Jeff Gordon and the amount of time he lost in that last exchange. As a matter of fact, Jeff Gordon has fallen back all the way to this next group of Kevin Harvick and Jimmy Johnson. Matt? About ten laps ago, Benny, Jeff Gordon came on the radio and said, I have to know who is coming, who is leading that pack so I can be ready to block because that big pack will blow by me in a second if I'm not careful. He was hoping Skinner would jump in front and act kind of like a blocker to help push him. Kevin Harvick and his teammate Jimmy Johnson are in that pack. So they're going to try to hook up as they're making the pass to the lead. Dale Earnhardt Jr. going for the lead of the Daytona 500. We'll see who so 97 Stewart goes. Not wanting to give it up. 97, who's he going with? Going to go with Stewart. 22, and he's going with Stewart. I had to think he would. <laughs> uh, Junior could not quite make it. He's still trying. Here oh, he goes look again. At this. Another run to the inside of Stewart, and he might have him this time. A great run for the turn three. Clear. He's got it. Good job. You're clear. <laughs> New leader of the 500 is Dale Earnhardt Jr. Wow. And the fans are going nuts in Daytona. You know, someone told me a couple of days ago, if this kid in the eight car wins a Daytona 500, we might not be safe in this town. These fans will go ballistic. They will rock the stands. Huh? They will rock the stands in Daytona. Okay, so now who spot is trying to make a deal with Kurt Busch's? <laughs> now we know pretty much what's going to happen. Dave? They told Tony Stewart right before that Kurt swears he's going to go with you. Now that was one opportunity, but I see at least another opportunity, guys, coming up where Kurt still has a chance to help the 20 a lot. Yes, you are right, Dave. Well, he tried, but it just, Junior was just enough to get around him. And a change for fourth place, Kevin Harvick, Jimmy Johnson. And now John Imachek trying to draft by Jeff Gordon. Imachek's going to get by. Is that Elliot Sadler behind Imachek as well? And up front, Dale Earnhardt Jr. with a little gap between himself and Tony Stewart. <laughs> Earnhardt Jr. in his fifth Daytona 500. He's had a good deal of success at this track's sister speedway in Talladega, Alabama, winning four of the last five races there. But he's had troubles in this race. 13th second, then 29th and 36th. His last two 500 finishes. Junior's car, if it was still a little bit loose, he's loving it now because as he as you run and put more laps on these tires, the car starts to tighten up and may get it just perfect near the end. Junior's got to be looking in the mirror a lot right now. Got to ante anticipate whatever move he thinks 20's going to make. It's a 20 is going to make a move, and he pretty much knows the 97 is going to go with him now. That die has been cast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> It'd just be interesting to see how long Tony waits because I don't think he can wait till the last two or three laps. Oh, I don't think so either. I, you know, you're I, gonna I have, have to do it. Yeah. If, he, if he's not under him coming to the white flag, it's gonna be awfully hard to finish a pass right in a lap. As, as evenly matched as these two cars have been all day. And we watched Happy Hour yesterday and we watched Dale Earnhardt Jr. in this A-car practice lap after lap, and we said he must not be happy. I talked to Tony Urias Sr. this morning, and why did you practice so much? Because the driver was not happy with the car. They finally put the car back chassis-wise like they raced it last year in the Daytona 500. And Junior said earlier in the show that every time you go out, it's different anyway. So I think they were trying to get as much information as they could to make the right adjustments. Tony Stewart has led nearly half of this Daytona 500. 97 on, laps. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I just told the next two cars in front of you to get us the bottom. That's what I was doing. Sorry. See, Stevie Reeves told us that he's not accustomed. Told Bill and I he's just not accustomed to someone like Junior on the radio. 
he wants to hear more. And he's so aggressive, you're right. He wants help all the time. Yeah. 14 laps to go. So Stevie didn't say anything down the back stretch, and Junior said, Come on, Spotter, tell me something. Yeah. And let me say, this is the first race that Stevie Reeves has spotted for the eight car. Last year, the job was done by Ty Norris. Looking, looking, looking. And you see the 97 is going to go. But Tony Stewart has got to be closer to the eight car for him to make that move. But don't you think, too, the 97 has got to be closer to the 20 for him to help Tony? Yeah, but if all three of these guys, all three of these guys have to get in a different spot than the eight is, but the eight is so far in front, he can just weave. So if the 20 gets a fender on the eight car and the other three, two cars line up, they will get, they should get by the eight car, but right now they can't get close enough to Dale Jr. You know, we criticized Frankie Stoddard for changing two tires, but if he can hang on for another 13 laps, that right was the right move because Scott Wimmer has a solid third place finish yeah. in the Daytona 500. Yeah, he's eight seconds ahead of fourth place Kevin Harvick. Whoa, another bob and weave by Stewart. See, like I said, Tony's not close enough got to get a little bit closer to Dale Jr. to do that. So what's he trying to do with all, with all that? Move? Just get Earnhardt Jr. to react and maybe unsettle his car with a, with a quick correction? Not so much to react with an unsettle the car, but to try to break the draft is all the time doing it. If he can move up and the 97 move up with him and Earnhardt move down, he'll gain that little bit on the right side. Dave. And as they look again to the outside, we believe the 97 can help the 20, right? Yeah. Well, Kurt's got this problem. The 22 wants him out of there because he knows he's a lap down. They just radioed that to Kurt, Matt. That's exactly right, Dave. In fact, Frank Stoddard just told Wimmer, he said the 97 is telling us they're going to pull out of the way with three laps to go. We're hoping that maybe he'll pull out sooner so we can get you up closer. What well, a great run that Tony got off turn two as Junior passed that lap car, but it wasn't quite enough. Go ahead, Bill. Why does Dale Earnhardt Jr. like restrictor plate racing when a lot of drivers say it's not their favorite type of racing? Because it makes you think, and he's thinking pretty hard right now. Well, the thing is, if the 97 car, Kurt Busch, pulls out and Wimmer passes him, those two front cars are going to be far enough ahead where I don't think Wimmer can even make an attack. And to go next time. And All three of them in front of you, I've told. Stewart is going to need help. They were not incorporated team so dominant at Daytona and Talladega where the restricted engine package is used. You saw the graphic. Michael Waltrip, winner of this Daytona 500, two of the last three years. But Dale Earnhardt Jr. has yet to win the sport's biggest race. It took his father 20 years to win it. Despite being this track's most victorious driver, Dale Earnhardt claimed 34 Daytona victories in his career. But Junior's car looks good, though. Looks very strong. They can't get to the rear bumper. So we're going to have to come up on some slower cars here. Well, that was what you just heard Earnhardt Jr. and his spotter Stevie Reeves talking about. Stevie has his job is to go talk to the spotters of those cars, make sure they know the leaders coming up behind them, and which lane the leader would prefer to have. They don't have to give it to him, but obviously they are giving Jr. the bottom now like he wanted to have. Dave? Kurt Busch radioed in. One more try for you, Tony. That's all I've got for you. Matt? Scott Wimmer was starting to fade a little bit from the 97. He asked Frank Stoddard, tell Bush not to pull out yet. I need to kind of gain back up a little bit of the ground that I lost. They're also thinking about the bigger picture. Momentum coming out of Daytona. A terrific run for this 22 car. Fantastic. Another car that we have, that is a surprise in the 500. We have not seen that speed in the 22 car until today. We saw it in the 23, his team car, but not the 22. Nine laps to go. And now those other two drivers, Kurt Busch and Scott Wimmer, fading off Tony Stewart's back bumper. That's not good news for them. fans of the orange car. Because unless the handling bottles on that eight car, one car by itself, the 20, is just not going to be able to pull around and pass him here at Daytona. I don't think so. Not Dale Denard Jr. Bill. Yeah, you guys are just talking about the past history here at this track. Tony, look at the outside. Jr. wants the inside. It was 56 years ago today on Daytona's famous beach course that NASCAR ran its first sanctioned race. Also on February 15th, David Pearson won the five.
500. That was in 76. The King won it on February 15th in 81. And Bill Elliott won from the pole in 1987. But, Alan, as you were talking about, many fans will tell you the greatest moment in NASCAR racing came more recently than that, when the late Dale Earnhardt Sr. won his first and only Daytona 500 six years ago today, February 15th, 1998. Uh, if you had the privilege of being here at Daytona that day, you'll never forget it. You saw what winning the Daytona 500 meant and the emotion that Dale Earnhardt showed in victory lane. It was like many had never seen him before. I think Stewart laid back. He laid back to get Kurt Busch to try to get a push by Junior. He knew he couldn't do it by himself. He tried to find someone to help him. And that's the smartest thing he could do. Exactly. If he just lays back and lets Kurt know he's going to lay back, they'll, have a, they'll get a heck of a run. A lot of drivers call this drafting thing a high-speed game of chess. Strategy, moves, knowing which moves to make and when. And that's why Earnhardt Jr. keeps asking Skeeney for that information, because if he sees the 20 laying back, he needs to lay back a little bit. And his dad, Dale Earnhardt, was the greatest of that. He saw a car backing up. He was backed up to them, so they couldn't get that run. Junior might be doing the same thing. Tony Stewart is so optimistic all week long. After some early speed week troubles, they got that 20 car handling dialed in on Thursday when they ran the qualifying races here that set the starting order for the 500. And since then, he's been very bubbly. Got into the final practice crash yesterday, turned his week on a downside, but right from the start of this race, that 20 car has been fast. It got up in the early laps, drafted with Dale Earnhardt Jr. to the front, and these two drivers have dominated most of this Ooh. race. And Bush lit up the race back there. Got to run. You're all clear. Bob and Reed. See, that was a spotter on the back stretch that gave him that signal. So Stevie Reeves from the front stretch really can't see that well coming off turn two. Five to go when they come to the start finish line. That's frustrating for the guys behind Junior and Junior's he's so antsy right now he wants this thing to be over. The 97's kind of drop back so watch for him hanging back. And Tony's like come on he's waving let's go come on come on let's go we need some help. What you saying Dave? Well I, I can't confirm that strategy that you'd mentioned about falling back but I can confirm that Tony on his own was doing everything that he could. He reached out and he said guys that is all I've got I'm giving all I can. That was when he was running alone. Gotta be frustrating for Stewart to track that eight car lap after lap, hoping it bobbles, hoping it bobbles, and so far, yeah, he just can't see it. Junior's not gonna bobble. I mean, he just needs he, what he has to have is help, and he doesn't have those guys close enough to do it. And Junior, on the other hand, he's going, yeah, get that 97 out of that pack. He wants to see that car as far back from the 20 as possible, Tony Stewart, because he knows that 97 Kirk Bush is not on the tail of Tony Stewart. Tony can't do anything with it. The teams have done all they can for their driver now, barring a caution flag, and even if a caution flag, these guys aren't coming to pit road. It's all up to the man behind the wheel. There are the Uries. Tony Uri Sr. on the left, Tony Uri Jr. on the right. Tony Uri Sr. working with Dale Earnhardt for so many years. And there's Joe Gibbs watching his driver, Tony Stewart. Try to learn the Joe Gibbs Racing Organization, a second Daytona 500 trophy. When Dale Earnhardt's children a little bit. wanted to go racing, that was Dale Jr., Kerry, and Kelly, the daughter. He turned them over to Tony Uri Sr. I said, okay, here you go. Here's my kids. Take them racing. See which one has some talent. And obviously, he has proven, Dale Jr. has proven to have some great talent. Kurt Bush, Scott Wimmer in the lap car of Kyle Petty. And that's not to say that Kerry doesn't have talent as well. Junior has certainly demonstrated himself to be a top-notch driver. Yes, he has. And he's trying to win NASCAR Racing's biggest prize, the Daytona 500. He'll be five miles away when he comes to the start-finish line this time. Afternoon sun beginning to cast long shadows over the Daytona International Speedway. And now just two laps remaining in this race. Stewart just can't get to him. Kirk Bush got back about three or four car lengths there. No help to the 20 car of Tony Stewart. 
But remember, we think back what happened to Bill Elliott at Homestead last year. Yeah, Hurt Senior here. And, and his father in 1990 with on the last lap right about, about right there. here. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a tire? Or? You're perfect. Not a problem at all. We've been stopping short for him all the day. And lost the race. <laughs> He asked me about fuel. And Tony Uri said, you're perfect. We've been stopping early because Tony Stewart had a problem with fuel. Fans come to their feet as Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Tony Stewart take the one play. We're in the final lap of the Daytona 500. Jr. took the lead from Tony Stewart with 19 laps to go after he trailed Stewart's on Chevrolet for much of the central part of the race. Now he's got to hang on for three quarters of a lap to earn a victory in the sport's biggest event. Stewart not close enough to make a move yet. It's all going to come down to whether Earnhardt has a bobble or a problem in his final third of the lap. Well, you can't get emotional yet because you've got to get off turn four and back to the start finish line. And you can see it now. The legacy continues. Dale Earnhardt Jr. wins the 46th Daytona 500. Second, Scott Wimmer third, Kevin Harvick fourth, Jimmy Johnson fifth. For Dale Earnhardt Jr., his first victory in the 500 in his fifth try. Well, there are some happy, happy, happy people. But none no happier than him. Oh, that's that's right. right. You can't overstate the months of preparation that go into running this one race. These teams take these cars to the wind tunnel, various engineering rigs like chassis dynamometers and seven post rigs to test them, get them all dialed together for this one shot at getting their names inscribed on the Harley World Trophy. And it's Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s who will be inscribed as the 2004 winner. Matt? A hug from Danny Earnhardt. Tony Yuri Sr. It's the Daytona 500. This track is so meaningful for you and the Earnhardts. What does this mean to win it, finally? Phew. I know what uh, Big E went through all them years trying to win this race. Hey. We just won the Super Bowl of this, this NASCAR racing, and uh, you don't believe how hard we worked to get here. We got to thank John Andretti, Slugger, Michael Walter, uh, everybody. It's great. <laughs> Tony, he is like your other son. This has to be special for you to help him win this dream. Yeah. These two kids I got here, Dale Jr. and Tony Jr., uh, they both worked their guts out for this race team. We worked uh, 14 hours a day, seven days a week for the last month and a half to get here. Trying to build a car better than this car. We didn't think this car was going to be good enough to win this year. We just couldn't do it, so we rubbed on this one the week before we came. Worked the body shot to death and the fab shot to death and Wayne, Mickey, and AJ and Bruce and everybody else there. And uh, they did it, man. You guys back home, we did it. All right, there you stop right there and he college these fans. He's got something with this thing, I think. Just get out and acknowledge these fans. They love you. Here he comes. Here he comes. started now. Now there's a hug. Yeah. Tony Uri Jr. Dale Earnhardt Jr. Their dads grew up together. They grew up together. A 
Hunt from his uncle, Danny Earnhardt. Yeah, yeah, valid point just made to me there. He, he is leading the NASCAR Bush Series race that's going to run here tomorrow. I guess you better be careful how long that party goes on, huh? <laughs> J.R. Rhodes there in a white shirt. Who and the NASCAR official saying, okay, let's get this car to victory lane, please. We got a trophy to give you. Junior, the third, now completing the third father and son combination to win a 500. Luke Petty and Richard Petty did it. Bobby Allison and Davey Allison did it. And now Dale Earnhardt and Dale Earnhardt Jr. 29th driver to win the 500. Get that thing stuck in the grass. It's wet from all the rain we had here last night. I think there's enough people down there to push it out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, I saw my daddy do this back in 19, what, 1998. 98. Yes, sir. Dave Burns. With Tony Stewart, who finished second. Hey, coming in, I heard the pride in your voice to your crew, but I know there's got to be some frustration after following for so long and not being able to pass that eight car. And, and leading most of the day. I tell you what, I'm so proud of this Home Depot team. I mean, John Andretti crashed us yesterday just being stupid, and but that's what John does. So, uh, but I mean, he tore a lot of things up on a, on a good race car, and these guys worked all night to make it right. And uh, I tell you what, I've, I couldn't be more proud of this Home Depot team. They just, they never gave up all week. I mean, we we, were, we had a great handling car all week. We just needed speed, and you know, Mark Cromquest and all the guys back in Charlotte, the engine department at Joe Gibbs Racing, and all the guys here at the track. I mean. We just kept throwing combinations after combination after it and just kept working on our car. And uh, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just so proud of these guys. I can't believe it. it was, I mean, uh, sure, I'd love to be down there in victory lane right now. But, I mean, the eight car was the class of the field all week. And, uh, you know, to, to stay ahead of him as long as we did, I mean, when he decided he was ready to pull the pin, he pulled it. But, uh, you know, at the same time, I mean, we, we ran a good race. And, I mean, I'll tell you what, him and I have worked together as a team at these restrictor plate tracks for the last three years. And, you know, it, as long as we can get that combination like this and finish one, two like this, uh, you know, he's got his now. I'll get mine next year. All right, very close for Tony today. His best finish in six Daytona 500s. Bill Weber in victory lane. I'm in victory lane, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. will once again climb out of his victorious Budweiser Chevrolet. In the same victory lane where six years ago today, his father celebrated a win in the Great American Race, the only time. His dad won that race. It took his father 20 tries. Junior is here as a kid. There's Tony Uri Sr., a big hug for his other son. Now the family's here. Teresa Earnhardt. How long is the party going to last? Man, I don't know. <laughs> you got a race tomorrow, you know. Yeah, I don't, it's going to be hard to do that, huh? <laughs> Good God. I'm Daytona 500 champion. I can't believe it. Forever, Dale, forever. Yeah, I'm just amazed, man. It's just awesome that uh, I couldn't believe I passed him by myself. What's Tell me about it. Going on here? Tell me about it, because you, you were thinking about it for a while. Oh, I was trying for a damn while, but I didn't know. Uh, it's going on forever. It's like a magic trick. Um, I tried, tried to figure out how to pass him, and I got a run on him, and uh, made it happen somehow. I don't know. But you don't know what you're doing at that point. You're just trying your heart out. And uh, I had, a, I had, a, I had a great car, awesome car, built by Tony Senior and all the guys. I want to say to my sister, and my mama back home, all my friends. Uh, good God, I can't believe it. It's the greatest ever. We talked during testing. You said you thought it's harder to win the Daytona 500 than to win the next Hell Cup champion. Yeah, I ain't got to worry about that no more. <laughs> I sure don't. Man, I tell you, it's a hard race to win. You know, it's a season in itself. That entire race is just, there's so many things going on, so much running through your mind. You know, I've seen it, been lost so many times by Dad over and over, and I, I was taught so many lessons by this place before I ever got behind the wheel. And God, I'm glad I ain't got to worry about it no more. Man, this is awesome. You're only the third father-son combination to win the Daytona 500. Dale, your father won it six years ago today. Yeah, I mean, he 
he was over in the pasture side right with me. I'm sure he was having a blast. Uh, believe it or not, I'm real surprised. The Goodyear tire did good all day. I didn't expect our car to handle them so well, but uh, the car drove awesome all day. It's real, real loose there at the end, but uh, you know, has had to be that way to be able to run good on old tires. And uh, Tony had a great car. We kind of been such good friends, you know, and, and uh, we helped each other all day. And and uh, by the way, uh, thinking of my other teammate, Michael Watcher, I'm glad he's all right. That was a scary looking accident, but I got a full week ahead of me. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, you're going to be a little busy for the next few days. Yeah. Hey, you're leading the championship standings, too. Right, for the first time in my life. This is awesome. <laughs> Congratulations, Thank Dale. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is the Daytona 500 champion of 2004. He described the pass on Tony Stewart for us. Chevy congratulating Dale Earnhardt Jr. and the number eight Monte Carlo on today's big win. Our Chevy winning moment is Earnhardt Jr. Getting around Tony Stewart to take the top spot in the 500 for good with 19 laps to go. <laughs> well, he, he said, I don't know how I did it. Well, I'll tell you what, he did it. He, he flew by the 20 car. Got right up to the door. Had a heck of a run, a lot of momentum. And Kurt Busch in the 97 car tried his best to help the 20 keep up with him. It would not work. No car has dominated cup racing like the defending manufacturer's champion, Chevy. American Revolution. Results on the 46th Daytona 500. Dale Earnhardt Jr., the winner in his fifth attempt, the 29th different driver to win a 500 in its 46 years. And don't go away. Extensive post-race coverage of this great American race coming up. We'll talk with all of the top finishers. We'll hear from Kevin Harvick, uh, Jeff Gordon, Scott Wimmer, hopefully. Jimmy Johnson will be in there as well. As I said, extensive post-race coverage coming up, so stay with us. We're not done here at the World Center of Racing yet. We look at the final results from today's Daytona 500. Some of the drivers involved in the big 12-car accident on the back straightaway near the race's midway point, including defending winner Michael Waltrip. Everyone okay from the crash, but a number sidelined in their Daytona 500 dream dashed for another 12 months. The 10 cars not able to complete the 500 miles in Daytona. And Mark Martin, Jeff Burton, Casey Kane, all out early with engine problems. Tony Stewart down to congratulate his rival for the Daytona 500 trophy today, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and team. A valiant effort by Stewart. You heard Tony express a lot of pride in his team, had to rebuild his wrecked race car last night. But it wasn't enough to hold off Jr., who wins the Daytona 500 of 2004. We're back after this.